Morning, officers. As said, we now move to stage three proceedings on the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Bill. And in dealing with the amendments, members should have the bill as amended at stage two, the marshal's list and the groupings. The division bell will sound and proceedings will be suspended for five minutes for the first division of the afternoon as usual. The period of voting for the first division will be 30 seconds. Thereafter, I will allow a voting period of one minute for the first division after a debate. Members who wish to speak in the debate on any group of amendments should press the request to speak buttons as soon as possible after I call the group. Members should now refer to the marshal lists of amendments. And in that regard, I will move to Group 1, which is Fish Farm Management Agreements and Statements. And I call Amendment 8 in the name of Tavish Scott, grouped with Amendments 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 3 and 15. Mr Scott. Thank you very much, Deputy Presiding Officer. In moving uh, the amendments in my name in this group, I want to make sure that the Scottish salmon industry, which has been a notable economic success uh, over some years now, continues that way. My concern about this bill, and indeed the particular measures uh, in the government's proposals, are that they add cost, bureaucracy, and, leave, and can create the real danger of micromanagement uh, of an industry, which I cannot believe is in the Minister or indeed the government's interests. And even if it uh, was this government's intention to uh, micromanage industry in this way, which I genuinely don't believe that to be the case, uh, then there is always the danger of a future government of what they may, may wish to do with the very sweeping powers that this government is taking in by passing, as they assuredly will, this bill and their amendments uh, today. This is an industry that has grown uh, considerably in recent years. The government themselves have a target of growing production by 50% by 2020. It employs 1,100 jobs directly on farms and 4,000 in processing and has invested £205 million by way of capital expenditure over these past five uh, years. So it therefore cannot be in any government's interest, never mind Parliament's interest, uh, to, uh, ensure, to introduce a bill uh, which would fail, in my view, their own better regulation task force tests. Just the other day, it was explained to me what that task force had done under successive governments to reduce unnecessary bureaucracy and cut red tape uh, to ensure that industries across Scotland have more ability to compete in very competitive marketplaces which in this case is in the food marketplace against international competitors uh, who have no such regulation. As the Minister will, I'm sure, accept, this is a very heavily regulated industry. Uh, many, many government bodies, local authorities and others already regulate salmon farming to a very considerable extent. And now with this bill, with these particular measures, the government, through its own department, Marine Scotland, will become potentially involved in every aspect of farm management. And that is the purpose of my amendments uh, in this group today to simply uh, avoid that very real difficulty. We can all foresee circumstances uh, for those of us who have represented um, communities and islands and uh, areas on the, in parts of Scotland where this industry does uh, economically succeed, uh, where the use of powers, the ability of agencies to become involved on a day-to-day -day basis is already there. And yet this government wishes apparently to take more powers in that area. And that is a very real concern that's been expressed to me, and I know other members uh, across all political parties in this chamber, uh, of uh, this particular uh, bill. Now, I appreciate the Minister has written to uh, the industry stating that uh, it is not his intention to micromanage the industry, and for what it's worth, I entirely uh, believe the Minister. My concern is not about an individual Minister, it's about government legislation which will be on the statute book long after he and I have both left this place. And that is my concern about this legislation uh, that we are uh, passing uh, today. And in considering the particular uh, uh, aspects of fish farm management agreements, uh, I would argue that there are already are very strong working relationships, good working relationships between government uh, using its uh, own agencies uh, and the industry. There has been a very progressive approach to how the industry uh, can develop. And I do not uh, and cannot find the justification for the uh, range of additional powers and responsibilities that the government wish to take on uh, in respect of this particular uh, industry and in respect of how they could operate uh, in the uh, future. I particularly in this sense make uh, mention 
uh, of uh, sa uh, sampling, which has been a big issue. As the Minister knows, there is potentially an ECHR challenge uh, to that. I appreciate the Government's line will be, of course, the Bill is uh, legally competent, as is the Parliament's line on this, uh, but I know the industry have very real uh, questions and have taken their own legal advice on that. So, in considering this amendment, Presiding Officer, and in the, indeed this group of amendments, I would ask that Parliament considers the balance between uh, an industry uh, achieving the Government's own targets in respect of increasing production to export across the world and be a great Scottish success story and the sweeping powers that are being taken here in respect of the day-to-day -day management of an industry. I so move. Thank you very much. I now call on Claudia Beamish to speak to Amendment 10 and other amendments in the group. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, during Stage 1 evidence, the UK Environmental Law Association made a number of comments relating to the effectiveness of farm management areas. And in relation to Amendment 10, they stated that it is important to state that the intended purpose of farm management of, uh, agreements and statements, so the operators are aware of the scope of this obligation. The placement of this new provision immediately before Sections 3 and 4 of the 2007 Act states, and I quote, that for purposes, certain purposes, including the improved prevention, control, and reduction of parasites, pathogens, and diseases, reflecting the words used in Section 32A and 62A of the 2007 Act. Without stating the purpose, it would indeed be possible, in my view, for an FMA to set out arrangements for sea lice management that did not satisfy the policy intention of the Bill and yet comply with the provision as drafted. Thus, to state the purpose and scope of the farm management agreements and statements in this new section is an amendment that I'm taking forward. I'd also like to speak to 11, 12 and 13. Uh, why are these amendments needed? In my view, uh, and also in the view of the UK Environmental Law Association in their Stage 1 evidence, they made a number of comments relating to the effectiveness of farm management areas. They stated that the improved control of sea lice, etc., would be better achieved by cooperation of all the operators in a farm management area so that the bill could establish a hierarchy between farm management agreements and farm management statements, making FMAs the default. That was the basis of the Amendment 49 at Stage 2. And as the bill currently stands, I, I believe it does not, it, it does no more than maintain the status quo, rather than seeking to ensure that current good practice is promoted across the sector. According to the SSPO, the basis of the area management is that sites operating within defined farm management areas adopt similar and joined up farming practices, for example, stocking of the same year class of fish and synchronised following of sites at the end of a production cycle. These amendments are therefore designed to ensure that the FMAs and the FMSs contain provisions about the coordination of parasite management, harvesting of fish and following of the farms after harvest to ensure that section 4A uh, brackets 4B includes specific reference to coordination of activities, I'll speak to this amendment. I'd also like to speak briefly to um, Alex Ferguson's Amendment 3 on the publication of FMAs and FMSs. Um, I believe that this will provide transparency in the development of strategies with interested parties, particularly I would emphasise including that of local community interests. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Alex Ferguson to speak to Amendment 3 and other amendments in the group. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. I listened very carefully to what Tavish Scott had to say in his comments because I appreciate that he has a, a great knowledge of the, of the sector. But I, I, don't, uh, I, agree, I agree with him about many things and about many of the amendments he's put forward in this bill, but I cannot entirely agree that there is not a need for, for greater openness and accessibility for this particular industry. Um, and that's really what this amendment in my name refers to. And in relation to that amendment, I want to draw the, attention, the Chamber's attention to an article from the Sunday Herald that was published on the 5th of May, headed Pesticides from Salmon Farm Prison Scotland, Poison Scotland's Locked. Now, you have to cut through the journalistic license within that headline, presiding officer. I accept that. But what this story highlights is a report by SEPA on the analysis of samples taken from around 24 fish farms in 2010, 2011, and 2012. 
CIFA detected residues of pesticides at 19 of the sites tested, with 12 of them, that's 50%, showing levels in breach of CIFA's environmental standards. One of those sites, Loch Shiel on the east of Lewis, showed residues of the pesticide teflubenzeron, that is a delousing agent for salmon, which were up to 455 times higher than SEPA's environmental quality standards in 2012. Now, in anybody's language, presiding officer, that suggests a problem. I absolutely accept there's an ongoing debate about the extent to which these pesticides harm other species and, indeed, the wider marine environment. And this is, of course, not the time to enter that debate. But I do believe that reports of this nature highlight the need for the fish farming industry to be as open and transparent as it can possibly be in this day and age. Now, my Amendment 3 would ensure that farm management agreements and statements are publicly accessible. If they were, then scientists and academia, along with NGOs and the wild fish sector in particular, would be far more able to evaluate and consider incidents and reports, such as the one I've highlighted, in the full knowledge of the agreements and statements that were in existence within the area in question because they would, they would then be provided with a contextual background to those incidents. I believe that the acceptance of this amendment would greatly improve the relations and understanding between particularly the farmed fish and the wild fish sector, a key aim of the committee's deliberations, without carrying any commercial risk or significant cost to the producers, and I commend it to the Chamber. On the other amendments, presiding officer, we will support amendments 8 to 13 on the grounds of simplification and clarification, but while very much attracted to the simplicity which Amendment 15 brings, um, I still need to be convinced of the need to delete the details of inspections that the Bill currently contains. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I call on Graham Day. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. The introduction of the word coordinated to this section of the Bill, I think, has the potential to complicate rather than simplify matters. I think, by definition, a farm management agreement requires cooperation, the adoption of a degree of practical, sensible, joined-up working practices, but which also takes account, for example, of meeting the requirements of retail contracts, because let's remember, fish farms are there to meet a consumer demand. The introduction of the word coordinated for me actually introduces a degree of confusion, particularly in relation to sections 4b3 and 4b4. Without specifying what is actually meant by coordination, these amendments have the potential, I feel, to be problematic in practice. For example, what would coordination mean in relation to the movement of live fish on and off farms and harvesting? Would it be prescribing such actions to be carried out simultaneously across all farms in an FMA, regardless of perhaps temporary circumstances on a farm, or indeed meeting contractual obligations, or consequentially? And if it is the latter, then would, would coordination mean actions being delivered at individual farms a week apart, a month apart? Presiding officer, I would urge members to reject these amendments 11, 12 and 13. Thank you very much. And I now call on the Minister, Paul Wheelhouse. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer, and I welcome the discussion around this part of the Bill, uh, as all of the provisions relating to uh, fish farm management are fundamental to the wider purpose of the Bill and the principles of ensuring we have a regulatory regime which is appropriate, proportionate and complementary to the principles of sustainable growth. It is not, as some might suggest, uh, evidence of the Scottish Government wishing to micromanage the industry, and I do take on board uh, Tavish Scott's kind words that he doesn't suspect that I'm uh, intending to micromanage the industry. But our approach remains only to legislate where it's necessary to do so. Um, as at stage two, Tavish Scott suggested there were weaknesses in our intent to work within the framework of the Code of Good Practice uh, designated geographical areas. I maintain the position that farm management areas, agreements and statements are best considered within the context of that code. Claudia Beamish in amendments 11, 12 and 13 has suggested that as part of the development of FMAs and FMSs, uh, we should make it a requirement to coordinate aspects of fish health management. This seems unnecessary. I think Graham Day has uh, alluded to some of the concerns, as agreements by their very nature are coordinated, and coordination within a statement is clearly not possible given they involve only one company. Claudia Beamish in Amendment 10 has suggested that those party to a farm management agreement or statement must have in place measures to improve prevention, control and reduction of parasites, pathogens and diseases. I share Claudia Beamish's goal regarding prevention, control and reduction measures, but I believe the amendment is, is unnecessary, as existing powers in the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Act 2007 are available to ensure that measures are in place to prevent, control and reduce parasites. In addition, farm sites are required to follow good biosecurity practice as part of their authorisation conditions 
granted under the Aquatic Animal Health Scotland Regulations 2009 that implement the European Directive uh, 2006-88EC. That requirement is implemented by farms having biosecurity measure plans in place. As at stage two, I consider the statutory publication of FMAs and FMSs, as suggested by Alex Ferguson, to be disproportionate in approach and to carry a significant commercial risk if the information is taken out of context or misinterpreted, as well as imposing an unjustified burden. Moreover, it could create a, distinct, uh, a disincentive for operators to include substantial detail in their agreements, as they may become concerned that a positive approach could be presented out of context. Well, happily taken to mention. I, I thank, you, Jim, thank you for taking such an intervention. If, if, if the current arrangements and the ones he's described are working so well, then why does SEPA find uh, pesticide deposits 455 times its agreed uh, limit? Minister? Uh, clearly, uh, I share the member's concern about the, 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 uh, the findings in relation to the SEPA work, but that in itself demonstrates that SEPA are identifying a problem. They are reporting on it, and the, the regulatory system is, is in place to tackle it. What we are talking about here is publishing uh, data which, or information which is privy to those operators within the FMA area in a public format, where it might pro provide a disincentive for them to provide uh, additional detail over and above the minima. So um, it, it is a concern that by forcing them to publish, they will cut back the amount of information they put in the public domain. And, and finally, I admit defeat in persuading Tavish Scott uh, that there is to be a link between the requirements of an FMA and a, uh, an FMS. I need to make an informed assessment of compliance. Nevertheless, I maintain uh, my position that, that that is in fact the case. Uh, I invite members to resist amendments 3, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13 and 15. Thank you very much. And I now call on Tavish Scott to wind up and press to withdraw his amendment. Well, thank you for signing off. So the, the Minister admits defeat but knows he's going to win. It must be a great position to be in, uh, uh, Mr Wheelhouse. Um, can I, just on, on uh, uh, Alec Ferguson's uh, amendment, um, I just thought the one point um, that the Minister could also have made, I have to confess I, I share the Minister's concerns about, that, about Amendment 3 in this regard, is that uh, yes, SEPA, uh, as Mr Ferguson and, and uh, the Minister pointed out, did find and did uh, research this, but I think there are some fundamental questions for SEPA in that, because after all, they provide discharge consent uh, permissions for uh, fish farms the length and breadth uh, of Scotland and it does seem to me uh, at least a question to be posed to them as to what happened in their process and in their monitoring processes during the course of their normal day-to-day -day activities that this is how this information came to light uh, in the context of their discharge consents. Uh, I also share, the Minister described it as out of context, which is a very diplomatic way of, of, of uh, what would actually happen in practice, and I'm sure Mr Ferguson would accept that um, there are some who might be less charitable than he in using that information in a very, very, uh, shall we say, public uh, manner, and for that reason I, I, I don't find favour with uh, Amendment 3. I take the Minister's points in respect of, of uh, my amendments, but I would have been uh, much more minded, shall we say, to withdraw them. Had the government set out... Yes, of course. Ms. Ferguson. I'm grateful to Mr Scott as well for taking the intervention. Would you not agree that the accessibility of some data is better than the accessibility of none at all? I point. I think that is a, a reasonable uh, point. Uh, the judgment, of course, is about the word sum. And uh, that is, a, I appreciate, a, a difficult uh, judgment call in respect of any of these uh, decisions. But those of us who have, um, and Mr. Ferguson will remember this, because those of us who lived through the period in the early 2000s when the industry came under enormous pressure from, shall we say, certain lobbies without justification, um, it reminds me of what can go wrong when that word sum is interpreted by, uh, by um, uh, others who would take issue with an industry in that uh, respect. So I'm afraid going to be uh, going to be a bit cautious on, on uh, that one. I just want to make the final point that uh, I take the Minister's points in respect of the micromanagement uh, argument. I would just wish that the Government would set out clearly how they will avoid that. I, I repeat the point that uh, uh, it is not my contention that this Minister or his officials will, will do. Of course, yes. Well, well, I'm grateful to Tavish Scott for taking a, a, an intervention. I think ultimately there's an onus in all of us in this Chamber uh, to recognise that Ministers are held to a now, if there's a degree of micromanagement suggested in a future government, a future administration, a future minister, we have a duty as a, as a parliament to hold ministers to account, and I, I would expect to be held to account if I overstep the mark in micromanaging the industry. So that is a final sanction this place has on ministers in that regard. Well, uh, that's a very fair answer, if I may say so, but uh, the, my concern about that is, as I repeat the point, is not this minister, um, but it's uh, what could happen in the future, and those of us who are charged with passing legislation in this place must, uh, I think, express that uh, responsibility 
responsibility with an eye to what uh, happens not just now but in the future as well. And for that reason, Presiding Officer, uh, I wish to move the amendments in my name. Many thanks. And the question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. And therefore there will be a division. And as this is the first division of the Stage 1, I suspend for five minutes.
you. And so we will resume. And the question is that Amendment 8 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. There will be a division. Please vote now. The vote on amendment number 8 is yes, 43, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 9 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with amendment 8. Mr Scott, to move or not move? Move, presenting officer. Thank you. And the question is that amendment 9 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 9 is yes, 46, no, 63. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 10 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with amendment 8. Is Beamish to move or not move? To move. Thank you. The question is that amendment 10 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. The result of the vote on amendment number 10 is yes, 46, no, 63, there were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 11 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with amendment 8. Is Beamish to move or not move? To move. Moved. The question is that amendment 11 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in amendment number 11 is yes, 46, no, 62, there were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And I call amendment 12 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with amendment 8. Is Beamish to move or not move? To move. Moved. The question is that amendment 12 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now.
The result of the vote on Amendment No. 12 is yes, 46, no, 62. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 13 in the name of Claudia Beamish, already debated with Amendment 8. Claudia Beamish, to move or not move? Moved. Moved. So the question is that Amendment 13 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in Amendment No. 13 is yes, 46, no, 62. There were no abstentions. The amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call Amendment 3 in the name of Alex Ferguson, already debated with Amendment 8. Mr Ferguson, to move or not move? Move, presiding officer. Thank you. <laughs> the question is that Amendment 3 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. The result of the vote in Amendment No. 3 is yes, 42, no, 67. The amendment is therefore not agreed. And we now move to Group 2, which is a duty to publish information on parasites. I call Amendment 14 in the name of Claudia Beamish in a group on its own. Ms Beamish to move and speak to Amendment 14, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. That seemed to cause a bit of a stir, but I will just uh, continue. Um, there was a great deal of discussion during Stage 1 about the appropriate resolution of the publication of sea lice data. In the Stage 1 report, the Committee stated that publication of sea lice data should be at a farm management area level, a step further than that pr proposed by the SSPO. Publication of such data will allow the industry to demonstrate their management response and performance in relation to sea lice at a resolution relevant to the management unit of the coordinated sea lice treatment, the farm management area. Under the, farm, the Fish Farming Businesses Record Keeping Scotland Order 2008, fish farms are already required to maintain a record of the number of parasites counted in the course of the weekly parasite counts. However, there is no current requirement to publish such data. In the 2007 Act, should therefore be amended to require the publication of data of parasite counts on a week-to-week -week basis, averaged over the farm management area, and this, could be, this would, should be consistent with the regulations of Section 1, Paragraph 2 of the Record Keeping Order. That such publication occurs within a month, as in the case in Ireland, and that the data should remain for inspection and not be removed at the next reporting period. The latter point is in relation to a major failing in the current system operated by the SSPO, in my view, under which data is only available for three months and then cannot be accessed, even on request. The amendment text is slightly different from that tabled at stage two. The original wording used the word compiling, but did not set out how long it should take to compile the data, Potentially, this could be used as a, delaying, as a delay to publication on the basis that the data is still not compiled. I really want to stress on this amendment that in the interest of the development of good relations between the relevant sectors, I ask the Minister, even at this late stage, to consider this amendment. It is quite clear to me that transparency must be the overriding principle, and nothing I have heard in evidence over the months 
has come any way to convincing me that there are counter-arguments to invalidate this really strong, important principle. This requirement for openness and transparency should be on the face of the bill. It is not acceptable to play wait and see. The proposed amendment is a suggested compromise position. I am not asking that the publication be at farm level, but at a farm management area level. Neither am I asking that it's published immediately. The delays in recognition of industry concerns that there should be time to put any difficulties to rights before publication. Surely this should not threaten but enhance consumer confidence. Publication is, in my view, in the public interest. Any arguments put forward about commercial confidentiality simply do not make sense if the acknowledgement of the time delay as put forward is taken into account. What other... Thank you. Yeah. Minister Paul I'm Wheelhouse. very grateful to the member for taking intervention. Just on the point about not making sense uh, in relation to uh, confidentiality, would the member accept that where there's a farm management area which has a single operator operating in it, if the data are divulged, that would breach commercial confidentiality and could cause some risk to that business? Uh, I understand what the minister is saying, but there are very few places where there is only a single farm. And I think it's very important that I put forward the delay issue because uh, in terms of commercial confidentiality, this will enable that particular farm or firm to sort out any problems and show what their recommendations are for the management in order to give the, uh, by the month's delay, to give the confidence um, that when it's published, to be able to show that something is being done about that issue. Um, what other industry indeed is allowed to hide successfully behind commercial confidentiality when both the transparent development of scientific research and the public interest are on the other side of the scales? Not farming, not waste management, not air pollution. Perhaps the Minister can name something now, even at this late stage. There is good practice in sea lice management in the aquaculture industry, of course. It should be possible to make this publicly shared and science should be shared, not just within Marine Scotland, but across academia, enabling good practice to be made even better. How can this happen with secrecy at the heart of the sea lice data challenge? This amendment, in my view, will also help build trust in relationships between the different relevant sectors, essential if we are to have sustainable jobs and sustainable seas here in Scotland. Thank you. Thank you very much. I now call on Graham Day. Thank you, Presiding Officer. As a member of the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee, I very much agreed with the Stage 1 report on the Bill when it stated that it would like to see data collated for each farm management agreement and each farm management statement where an agreement is not in place, and again where it expressed concerns over the current lack of accessible data, leaving an important gap in scientific research. At the time, I was also in accord with the view that what was required was access to farm-by-farm -farm data for scientific purposes, and at very least considering publishing that data. But that unanimously agreed position was, though, to some extent, I think, informed by the lack of a credible argument put forward by the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation against publication at a more granular level than they were offering. Although, as I recall noting during the Stage 1 debate, the Minister had articulated concerns about the possible negative commercial impact of doing so. We have moved on since then, however, Presiding Officer. The SSP have subsequently engaged more positively, at least in terms of explaining their worries about mischievous and perhaps malicious use of farm-by-farm -farm data that is published. And more importantly, they have demonstrated a willingness to compromise. Now, Norway is held up as an example of somewhere that the sea lice data is published without ill effect on the industry. We should also take account, however, of what happened in Ireland, where they followed that course uh, and we are from aspiring to grow the fish farming sector from 15,000 tonnes annually to 50,000 tonnes, they found themselves producing 14,000 tonnes a year, with the use that the sea lice data was put to accepted as being a contributory factor, although by no means the only factor. Now, from initially undertaking to voluntarily report sea lice data on the basis of 30 rather than the six areas they had been, the SSPO is now providing Marine Scotland data for 76 FMAs, which, although not published, will be available for research purposes. Now, I, I would contend that represents progress, and I support this position because it represents a balanced and proportionate step forward. 
Where we are now, it's a sensible compromise. Data being published at a 30 area level, providing a degree of transparency which offers reassurance to the public and access to information that can be utilised to better direct the science. And of course, this matter can, as I understand it, be kept under review through the Ministerial Group on Sustainable Aquaculture, with the Scottish Government having the power under the 2007 Act to legislate if this voluntary approach isn't working. It's a fair and balanced approach, presiding officer, which sends the message that we treat the sea waste issue seriously, but also supportive of an industry that employs directly and indirectly around 6,000 people, and one I would encourage the Chamber to endorse. Thank you very much. I call on Alex Ferguson. Presiding officer, at stage one, I tabled an amendment that would have ensured the regular publication of sea life data on a farm-by-farm -farm basis. It was ably spoken to and moved by my colleague Jamie McGregor while I was on parliamentary duty in Malawi, a hard-working parliamentary duty in Malawi. Uh, but despite, despite Jamie's almost irresistible argument, somehow the minister found a way of resisting them, and the amendment was indeed rejected. The same fate befell an amendment by Claudia Beamish to reach a compromise by seeking, as does this one, the publication of data on a farm management area basis. Every scientist in this field wants farm-by-farm -farm data for analytical purposes. However, if that is not to be, and the Scottish Government has made very clear that it will not countenance it, then this is surely the most sensible compromise that has so far come forward. Farm management areas are already the agreed management units for the industry. They are accepted as such to the extent that, as Graham Day has just indicated, the industry itself has now voluntarily agreed to make the data available at farm management area level to Marine Scotland Science for the purpose of scientific research. I think the Minister also verified that at stage two. Now, if that is to be the case, then surely that data, when held by Marine Scotland Science, has to be publicly available through freedom of information. So why not just go the whole hog and, as somebody once said, publish and be damned? Because it's going to be available anyway, as far as I can see. If the industry does not take this final step, then the unfortunate question of what is there to hide will continue to hang over this industry. And I say that in, in the genuine belief that this is an industry of which we all want to be proud. Uh, I don't wish to denigrate the industry in any way. It has a huge role to play in rural employment and indeed in the whole um, economy of this country. Um, but they, eventually this subject will come back and back until the industry is completely open and accessible. I believe Claudia Beamish's amendment goes a long way to helping that and we strongly support it. Thank you very much. And as we are nearing the agreed time limit under Rule 9.8.4a, I consider it necessary to allow the debate on this group to continue beyond the limit in order to avoid the debate being unreasonably curtailed. I now call Tavish Scott. Also, uh, I'm concerned this amendment is farm by farm by the back door for the very reason that the Minister outlined in his intervention on Claudia Beamish's uh, remarks earlier on. Uh, I know of farms uh, in my constituency where they would be identified without a shadow of a doubt. That is the reality of it. And the commercial consequences of that are considerable. I, I, some may not believe that the commercial arguments are relevant to this debate, uh, and that's a point of view, but I'm afraid it's not one I uh, share. I also think that Graham Day's observations about the industry moving forward in response, in my view, to um, some helpful um, push from the committee, from the rural committee of this parliament, uh, has been the right approach. They have just this last couple of days announced uh, a fish health management report, which I think they've tabled to the minister, uh, and there are other, um, uh, and that, that in, for me is a very uh, sensible and constructive way forward. In addition, the science project that the um, industry, the SSPO, and the government are now taking forward, has to be the basis, even for Claudia Beamish and Alec Ferguson, in their observations about how the industry has to be as transparent as possible, because that science project, for me, does mean that there should be an independent assessment of the impact on uh, other species uh, of the industry. Now, that is, I suspect, what uh, many members on, uh, or what Claudia Beamish and Alec Ferguson are driving at, and that seems to me, therefore, a reason to allow that process to continue in the way in which Graham Day has suggested, uh, it deals with uh, a balanced and proportionate approach to this challenge, uh, and at the same time it ensures that we do not get embroiled in what I still think are pretty significant commercially confidential uh, issues which any industry is going to have very strong views about were this Parliament to uh, impose, no doubt a well-meaning, but I think a misjudged amendment. Thank you very much. I now call on Jane Baxter. Thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. I wish to speak very briefly in support of Amendment 14 
moved by my colleague Claudia Beamish. Members will recall from earlier stages of this bill that there has been much debate about the publication of sea lice data. The Minister indicated at stage two that the Ministerial Group on, Aqu on Aquaculture would keep this matter under review. I'd like to hear today from the Minister how he will judge that the arrangements by, for reporting of data are fit for purpose. I believe that the proposal put before us in Amendment 14 by calling for publication by farm management area and specifying publication dates reaches the necessary balance between making the data available and acknowledging the concerns of the industry. More importantly, it doesn't wait for any element of failure or non-compliance from the industry before requiring publication. I'm pleased to support Amendment 14. Thank you. I now call the Minister, Paul Wheelhouse. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Uh, members will be aware that this is a subject that has been debated several times as this Bill has progressed through Parliament. Um, during Stage 2, in response to a very similar amendment from Claudia Beamish, as, as Claudia Beamish has acknowledged, I noted we now have a commitment from the SSPO for enhanced voluntary reporting of sea lice data for 30 areas, based on recognised wild fish catchments. This will be published every quarter, with the first covering January to March, issuing at the end of uh, May. In addition, the SSPO will provide Marine Scotland Science with access to sea lice information at farm management area level to support defined research projects. These commitments are very welcome. If I can make some progress, please, Mr Ferguson, I will come back to you. Um, these commitments are very welcome. However, the voluntary public sea lice reporting approach must be seen as part of an overall package which allows us to ensure the environmental sustainability of fish farms. It is not the means by which compliance is judged. That is for a robust regulatory system, which this bill enhances overseen by the Fish Health Inspectorate, SEPA and others. Fish Health Inspectors may, of course, also access farm-level uh, data and indeed inspection of fish cages during their inspections. I give way to Mr Ferguson. Alex Ferguson. Again, I'm grateful to the Minister. He confirmed the fact that uh, information and data will be made available to Marine Scotland Science on request. Would he also confirm that that information, once in the hands of Marine Scotland Science, will be accessible through freedom of information? Minister. I, I certainly acknowledge the issue that Mr Ferguson raises. I think the key test is whether the data is retained by uh, Marine Scotland staff. And obviously we can, we can uh, discuss this issue at length and, uh, through the Rural Affairs Committee, but I, my understanding is that it would not necessarily be subject to FOI if the data is not retained by Marine Scotland. Um, I was reminded just last week in relation to a separate issue to pick up the issue of commercial confidentiality of the commercial risk to companies where data is published and then used selectively and out of context to suit other agendas. Now, I appreciate the well-intentioned uh, uh, amendments we have uh, before us today on a number of fronts, but this one would pose, a, I think, a significant risk that Tavish Scott has acknowledged to particular companies, especially where, as I said earlier to Claudia Beamish, there is a single uh, company operating a, at a farm management area uh, level. We need to balance the need for public reassurance with the commercial challenges under which the salmon farming industry operates taking into consideration the broader regulatory regime that exists. In this, this context, I believe the enhanced SSBO proposals offer a balanced and proportionate step forward, as Graham Day has indicated, and will, for the first time, allow comparison with wild fish catch and effort statistics, develop a better understanding of the potential impacts from fish farming. At stage two, I noted a commitment to reviewing the success of this voluntary arrangement within the life of this Parliament, and I reiterate that commitment today and note that we shall keep this issue under review through the Ministerial Group on Sustainable Agriculture. In relation to Jane Baxter's point, that group contains wild fisheries uh, interests and also environmental NGOs are involved as well. So there is an opportunity for us to go beyond the industry's view on the, the issue and take aboard points from, from others. If it appears that this voluntary arrangement is not operating as expected and it cannot be improved by voluntary means, then we shall use the existing powers in the 2007 Act to legislate. Uh, I believe the voluntary arrangements I have outlined address both Claudia Beamish's concerns as well as many of the concerns expressed during the previous stages of the Bill. And on that basis, Presiding Officer, I urge Parliament to resist this amendment. Thank you very much. I now call on Claudia Beamish to wind up and press to withdraw her amendment. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. I have listened with care to the comments made from across the Chamber on this issue. Um, in relation to um, Mr Day's comments, Graham Day's comments about the, um, the granular level of transparency, uh, also about the um, concerns he highlighted about how the industry has contracted in Ireland. But um, all the time that we've taken evidence um, in committee and all the, um, the evidence that has come to us in written form and all the visits that we've done, I have not come across any point at which it was stated that this was the reason 
Um, and uh, Ms. Um, Graham Day says it, it might have been a contributory factor, but I'm not convinced, uh, having not seen any evidence on this. Um, in relation to the science, it still perplexes me how um, can research, in the broadest sense of it, be shared across academia if this um, information is not made public. Marine Scotland may have the information, but there even seems to be concern highlighted um, in the discussion in the chamber today between uh, Alex Ferguson and the Minister about whether it would be accessible through freedom of information. It, it seems to me extraordinary that this information is not um, going to be available in, in an open way, especially in view of the delay. And I think the SS PO offer is certainly a step in the right direction. I acknowledge that, and in no way um, am I here to, to knock the industry in which there is very good practice. But it does not, in my view, go far enough, and um, I, I, I fail. Yes, thank you. Paul Pilas. I'm grateful to the member for taking intervention. Would, would the member accept that uh, we have the powers under the 2007 Act to legislate, that would bring forward proposals through secondary legislation, if necessary, to provide an alternative to the voluntary arrangement if that was proving effective. And does that not reassure the member that um, we are taking this issue seriously and I give a commitment to her that we would do that if necessary? Sorry, Beamish. I, I appreciate the Minister's commitment and I've listened carefully to what the Minister is saying. Uh, but uh, I still do not believe that that goes far enough and I would like to see this um, amendment put onto the face of the bill because um, the other argument that was put forward um, about uh, information uh, that's published being used selectively and out of context, I believe that de the delay will help with this. And I cannot think of any other industry where um, the suggestion is, I, as I understand it, and perhaps the Minister will correct me if I misunderstood this, that in, in relation to any um, campaigns or anything that might come up, that uh, this, this could be used in, in a way that is inappropriate. But I don't believe that that is a reason uh, to... Uh, not be open and not be transparent. And in an industry that I believe uh, with good practice has nothing to hide, I, I think that we should be continuing with this amendment. There's also the other point, two other points finally actually, that the planning permission issue is important and we need to be aware that um, publication of sea life data may inform future planning permission um, in particular estuaries and also um, that in relation to um, the, the, the rights of the consumer and the public to know that in, in view of the recent scandals we've had around horse meat, that I think the more transparency there is possible in relation to our food in an industry that in the main has an excellent record uh, needs to be pursued. Thank you. Thank you very much. So the question is that amendment for... Are you pressing or withdrawing your amendment? I'm, I'm pressing it. Thank you. So... So the question is that Amendment 14 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We, we are not agreed. There will therefore be a division and it will be a one-minute division. The result of the vote in amendment number 14 is yes, 40, no, 65. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. I now call amendment 15 in the name of Tavis Scott, already debated with amendment 8. Mr Scott, to move or not move? Uh, move, presiding officer. Thank you. The, the amendment is moved and the question is therefore that amendment 15 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a 30 second division.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 15 is yes, 4, no, 90. Um, there were 13 abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move to Group 3, which is regarding training in relation to equipment used in fish farming. But before we do, I just point out to the Chamber that we are several minutes behind, so brevity is now of the essence. I call Amendment 16 in the name of Jim Hume. Group with Amendment 17, 18, 19 and 20. Jim Hume to move Amendment 16 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. Uh, uh, Thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. I'll try and be as brief as possible, so uh, uh, not Grateful. knock it down to maybe a couple of thousand words instead of uh, 20,000 words that I had uh, prepared. Uh, I've brought these amendments forward at Stage 3 with alterations which I'm assured shall make them more workable in law. The Minister at Stage 2 was happy with the principle of my similar amendments and the need for them too. Therefore, I hope the Minister and his fellow members shall recognise that and accept uh, these amendments today, as he has already, already signalled to me uh, he would do. The Containment Working Group uh, recognised that around 29.5% of escaped farm fish were due to human error and not equipment failure. These amendments will mean that training to use equipment shall then be part of the developing technical standard as was recommended by the Scottish Aquaculture Research Forum. And I can quote from them that protocols for operational control, supervision, management and training from a containment perspective uh, are developed and these protocols should become a legal requirement. Presiding officer, I shall be brief. I will move the amendments 16, 17, 18, 19 and 20 in my name. Uh, I thank the Minister and the Government uh, team in working construct constructively with myself on them and hope that m fellow members recognise the importance of these amendments and therefore also note that these amendments shall address concerns, re-human error and fish escapes in the future and lessen the chance of this happening in the future. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now I call on Nigel Don. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I rise to support, sir, Mr Hume? Uh, not least because I think it's not only about containing fish, and that was the primary reason, but can I say that in any industrial process, training is essential because otherwise you will invariably run into health and safety issues. And out on cold water, and we've been there, you can readily see that those issues could be considerable. So I think the idea that people should be trained on these specific bits of equipment under those circumstances is extremely important. And I also recognize that the need to retain some sort of records of the training is an important part of ensuring that it has actually taken place. So I commend these amendments to the Chamber. Thank you very much. And Cla finally, Claudia Beamish, briefly, please. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Just to highlight that there is much good practice in the aquaculture industry, um, not least on the visit that we did as a committee to fish farms. And in relation to human error, I want to support um, the amendment, uh, move, uh, not moved, sorry, I apologise, um, I've spoken to by Jim, Jim Hume, but also in relation to health and safety of the employees on um, uh, on fish farms in often dangerous situations, which Nigel Dons also highlighted. Thank you. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I'll try and keep this briefer than I otherwise would have had. Um, I, I thank Jim Hume uh, for, for lodging Amendments 16 to 20, and I'm very pleased to support them uh, at, at, at the vote. As I said at stage two, I recognise the reasoning behind these amendments, and, and Jim Hume is, is quite right. Such training would seek to mitigate against escapes due to human error, and therefore is a welcome uh, protection for the marine environment. Um, I, I believe it's a response, um, a good response to the committee's own points that were raised at stage one report, and we're pleased support, to support it. Training is an important aspect of the work to develop technical standards, as well as the requirement for equipment to meet technical specifications. Work will also cover operational procedures, codes of practice, operators' manuals, and the training of operatives to ensure equipment is used appropriately and the procedures are followed correctly. So that's the work that's been done within the Ministerial Group for Sustainable Aquaculture, which will hopefully support um, the implementation of uh, Jim Hume's amendment. We are already working with the industry to ensure staff are appropriately trained, building on the best practice workshops and in-house schemes that industry has already introduced. Uh, and I've also asked the newly established MGSA Containment Working Group to consider the issue of training to prevent escapes due to human error. And indeed, the work on recognised training and qualification is, I understand, already well advanced. Uh, so, presiding officer, I hope that everyone in the chamber will join me in supporting Jim Hume's amendments 16 to 20. Thank you very much. Jim Hume to wind up and press or withdraw his amendments. Uh, no, uh, thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. Uh, 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 I welcome all the, all the support, of course, and, and, uh, and the kind words from Nigel Don regarding health and safety 
Uh, Claudia was quite right uh, in saying there is a lot of good practice by aquaculture. It's not like this is a, uh, uh, everybody is a bad practice and not training, but obviously with 29.5% uh, escapes from human error, there is an issue. And of course, welcome the Minister and his government team, uh, uh, their support, and of course, welcome the moves that the Minister has said he shall do today. I move the amendments in my name. Many thanks. And so the question is that Amendment 16 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. Call Amendment 17 in the name of Jim Hume, already debated with Amendment 16. Mr Hume, to move or not move? Uh, move. Thank you. And so the question is that Amendment 17 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are. And now call Amendment 18 in the name of Jim Hume, already debated with Amendment 16. Mr Hume, to move or not move? Uh, move. Thank you very much. And so the question is that Amendment 18 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I now call Amendment 19 in the name of Jim Hume, already debated with Amendment 16. Mr Hume, to move. Uh, move, Presiding Officer. Thank you very much. And the question is that Amendment 19 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are. I now call Amendment 20 in the name of Jim Hume, already debated with Amendment 16. Mr Hume, to move. Also moved, Presiding Thank you very Officer. much. And the question is that Amendment 20 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Excellent. I now move to Group 4, which is regarding well boats, time limit for appeals against enforcement notices. I call Amendment 21 in the name of Tavish Scott in a group on its own. Mr Scott, to move and speak to Amendment 21, please. Starting off, so this uh, amendment simply seeks clarity from the Government in respect to the difference between Section 16 and Section 6 of this Bill. I raise this at Stage 2 and just look for the Minister's uh, explanation because, for the love of me, I spent some time and I couldn't find it. Uh, I couldn't find the, uh, the uh, other legislation that he mentioned in his answer at Stage 2. Um, for clarity, uh, Section 16, are, uh, in respect of emergency action notices, uh, allows a 14-day period for appeal, yet in Section 6 the appeal period is only seven days. If the Minister is able to uh, clarify the difference in that, I'll be more than happy to, resist, to uh, not move this amendment. Thank you very much, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. At uh, Stage 2, I'll, I'll take up Mr Scott's challenge. Um, at Stage 2, Mr Scott said that if we could illustrate to him the Bill is consistent in respect of Section 6, which specifies uh, seven days for appeal, and Section 16, which specifies 14 days for appeal, he would, and he's reiterated this today, we'd be more than happy uh, not to move his amendment. Uh, so I hope I can persuade him of the case this time round. I can reassure him that the Bill is consistent. However, crucially, the number of days allowed for an appeal in Section 6 is deliberately different to Section 16 because the appeals relate to quite different situations. And I'll try and explain why. Uh, Section 6 replicates the provisions of Section 6.7 of the 2007 Act and provides for seven days to appeal against an enforcement notice. An enforcement notice will only be issued where the Scottish ministers are satisfied that a person has failed or is failing to comply with any requirement imposed by regulations. Seven days to appeal is reasonable and was accepted in the 2007 Act. Section 16, however, deals with a situation which, which is out with the control of the person being issued with the notice. Uh, no failure to comply with regulations is implied. There is no assumption that it is the person's fault that a commercially damaging species has been found on his or her fish or shellfish farm. Um, that is why an emergency action notice is issued and why we consider it reasonable to give the person 14 days uh, to appeal against the decision to serve the notice and the terms of the notice. It is why I do not see any need for the two sections to be consistent with each other and for these reasons, which I hope make clear um, the rationale and the need for differing provisions, I ask Mr Scott not to press Amendment 21. Thank you very much. Now I call on Tavish Scott to wind up and press or withdraw his amendment. I'm grateful, Presiding Officer, for the Minister reading that onto the record and making that full explanation. I'm content with that and will not press this amendment. Thank you very much. Uh, Tavish Scott seeks to withdraw his amendment. Does any, any member object? Uh, since no member has objected, amendment number 21 is withdrawn. So we now move to Group 5, which is regarding well boats and powers to detain in connection with court proceedings. And I call Amendment 22 in the name of the Minister, Group with Amendments 22, Group with Amendments 23, 24, 25, 26 and 27. Minister, to move Amendment 22 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. These amendments make similar provision for the detention of whaleboats in connection with uh, court proceedings as appear in sections 31 to 33 of the Bill for the detention of fishing vessels. Whaleboats which operate in Scotland tend to be foreign-owned and flagged. Marine enforcement officers have the power to direct or take a whaleboat to port to facilitate their investigations. The rationale for the power to detain a whaleboat in relation to court proceedings is to avoid the vessel sailing and accused persons attempting to evade being brought to justice. There is ambiguity regarding the scope of existing statutory provisions to detain vessels beyond the point where a report has been submitted to the Procurator Fiscal. This amendment is designed to put the matter beyond uh, doubt. With that in mind, Presiding Officer, I move Amendment 22. Thank you very much. Now call on Tavish Scott. Thank you, sir. Uh, my concern about these amendments, and the Minister uh, may correct me on this, is that they have not been subject to parliamentary scrutiny. They are, I think, uh, new measures in respect of this bill, and they take, as his other amendments do uh, later on, uh, some significant new uh, areas and, indeed, new powers. We did have a discussion at Stage 2, to my recollection, on well boats, but it was on the definition of a well boat, not in relation, again, and I'd be happy to correct on this, not in relation to the uh, powers of enforcement or the powers uh, of the fiscal in relation to uh, charges. Uh, given this Parliament doesn't have any mechanism whatsoever for reviewing legislation uh, once the, uh, at this late stage, once, if a Stage 3 amendment is tabled, which is new to uh, Parliament, and the committee uh, that has scrutinised this bill, as far as I can tell, has not seen and looked at this area in the past, I do have concerns that what is being introduced today is a new measure uh, without consultation. After all, the consultation on the bill was last year, um, and that is some time ago, uh, and that uh, must, con must be of concern in respect of how we make sure we adequately scrutinise uh, legislation in this place. Claudia Beamish, briefly, please. Uh, yes, uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Briefly, I'd like to um, align myself with the, with the remarks of Tavish Scott in that, although we are supportive of the policy intention, that uh, it is a very serious matter that um, Parliament has not been able to scrutinise um, these measures. Neither committee nor stakeholders, we haven't had evidence, and I wonder if there might have been questions about funding implications um, in relation to marine enforcement officers. Um, uh, and there has been consultation and pre-consultation, and these matters didn't come up. And while I appreciate that it is most likely an attempt by the Minister uh, to make sure that the legislation is as robust as possible, I do have serious concerns about the scrutiny issue. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alex Ferguson, briefly, please. Well, I can be very brief, presiding officer, because I simply want to um, associate myself with the remarks of both Claudia Beamish and Tavish Scott. I think it's regrettable that three different groupings have introduced three completely different parts of this bill, which we have not had a chance to scrutinise, on which stakeholders have not had a chance to make their opinions known, and there are, might well be other consequences that we are not quite aware of. Where this is difficult is because I, don't, I certainly don't disagree with the intentions of any of those three groupings, but I do very, very much regret the fact that the committee has not had a chance to scrutinise this in a way that the committees of this Parliament are uniquely supposed to do. It is the committees that hold the government to account on these issues. We have not had an opportunity to do so, and I very much regret that. Minister, to wind up and press your amendments, please. Well, I, uh, Presiding Officer, I certainly I listen to the points that are being made by members, and I do um, you know, uh, take on board the issue about the, the, the lateness in which these proposals come forward. It's a serious effort to uh, reduce the potential whereby our efforts to enforce uh, a, a, you know, a matter, a legal matter, would be, would be prevented because of the inability to detain the vessel. And so it's, with, uh, it's a sincerely meant uh, amendment to try and balance up the provisions which are, have been consulted upon in regards to uh, fishing uh, vessels with those that are covering well boats. Um, uh, having said that, I, continue, I will move to uh, press the amendment, uh, presiding officer. Thank you very much. And so the question is that amendment 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Uh, please vote now. This will be a one-minute division.
The result of the vote on Amendment Number 22 is yes, 51. 59. 59, thank you. No, 1. And there are 45 abstentions. So the amendment is therefore agreed. I now call amendments 23, 24, 25, 26 and 27 all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated. And I'd invite the Minister to move amendments 23 to 27 on block. From the news. Thank you. I'd ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 23 to 27. No. So, the question is, as no member has objected, the question is that amendments 23 to 27 are agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. Right. So, I now call amendment 23. The question is that amendment 23 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in amendment number 23 is yes, 59, no, 0, there are 46 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The question is now that amendment 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in amendment number 24 is yes, 57, no, 1, and there were 46 abstentions. So the amendment is therefore agreed. The question now is that amendment 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. This will be a 30 second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in amendment number 25 is yes, 59, no, 0, and there were 46 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The, question, the next question is that amendment 26 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a vote. 30 second division, please vote now.
result of the vote in Amendment No. 26 is yes, 59, no, 0, there are 46 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. And the final question now is question uh, 27. Uh, are we agreed to? Amendment 27, are we agreed to? We are not. Uh, therefore, there will be a 30-second division. Please vote now. And the result of the vote on amendment number 27 is yes, 59, no, zero. There are 46 abstentions, and the amendment is therefore agreed. And we will now move swiftly on to group six, which is carcass tagging regulations and offences. I call amendment four in the name of Alex Ferguson, group with amendment five. Mr Ferguson, to move amendment four and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Uh, thank you, presiding officer. At stage the, the stage one report of the uh, Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee strongly supported the individual numbering of tags and stated that it would be an essential part of making any tagging scheme effective, as would the recording of those tags for the sake of complete traceability. Such schemes are in place in every other part of the United Kingdom and in the Republic of Ireland. For once, presiding officer, Scotland is lagging sadly behind the rest. During the Stage 1 debate, the Minister actually said very little about a tagging scheme, despite the robust recommendations of the Committee's report. So I was a little taken aback that it wasn't until my amendment on this subject was being debated at Stage 2 that the Minister came up with the theory that if the amendment was accepted, the bill would have to be referred to Europe under the Technical Standards Directive with a consequential delay to the, time, to the timetable. Now, I'm not entirely persuaded by that argument because I'm also advised that notification would only have to be made when the regulations themselves were, were brought forward. So the issue therefore seems to me that any scheme that would be rendered unworkable if it was not accepted by the EU as Section 22 could therefore be rendered ultra vires. So can I ask the Minister when he's addressing this subject on what possible grounds he thinks the EU might reject such a scheme when individually numbered and recorded tags are already in operation in England, Wales, Northern Ireland and indeed the Republic of Ireland? And furthermore, if in some extraordinary way the scheme was indeed rejected by the EU, I cannot see how it would matter because a scheme which doesn't use numbered and recorded tags is not of any use to anybody at all. And you would therefore no longer really require the power to create a scheme, and that is the exact power that is given by Section 22. So I, very, I find it very hard to believe that accepting this amendment would constitute any real threat to this bill. I am very grateful to the Minister for the time he gave to discuss this with me last week, and I will listen carefully to what he has to say. I very much hope he will at the very least commit to making an, individual, an individually numbered and recorded tagging scheme the central principal proposal of the consultation that is to take place later this year. If he can do so, then I will happily um, consider whether or not to move this amendment. On Amendment 5, briefly, presiding officer, I'm afraid that the Minister and his advisers have somehow been overtaken by conspiracy theories while they've been considering it. For instance, I have been asked, and I quote, whether the amendment is for the policy purposes of controlling trade in the interests of salmon conservation as a whole, as opposed to bringing something fundamentally designed for the carcass tagging scheme in particular. Now, I can only say that I'm innocent of all such charges, presiding officer. This amendment is purely and simply about consistency of language. In no section of the 2003 Act is the reference to the word selling without the addition of the word buying. So if this amendment is not accepted, Section 22 will be the only part of the resultant Act that refers to selling without an equal reference to buying. This is no conspiracy, presiding officer. It is simply a request for consistency. Thank you very much. And once again, as we are nearing the agreed time limit under Rule 9.8.4a, I consider it necessary to allow the debate on this group to continue beyond the limit in order to avoid the de debate being unreasonably curtailed. Now call on Claudia Beamish. Thank you, Presiding Officer. 
Um, in relation to Alec Ferguson's Amendment 4, I would simply like to highlight um, that I find it quite odd to contemplate such a scheme without numbers. Um, while I respect the need for stakeholder consultation, which hasn't happened on this, I still um, would be looking for a commitment to um, consideration of numbered tags um, by the Minister today. Um, and in relation to Amendment 5 by Alex Ferguson, the insertion of um, by, as I understand it, uh, simply does bring consistency with uh, previous legislation. If, if you can't sell, why should you be allowed to buy? Thank you. Thank you. Minister, be as brief as you can, please. Um, apologies, Presiding Officer. I may have to take longer than I, I, would, I would hope to uh, do normally. Presiding Officer, there has been a considerable interest in the issue of carcass tagging during the passage of this bill, as members have acknowledged. The bill creates enabling powers to make a scheme, the detail of which is to be set out in secondary legislation. That is a point I have maintained all along. Um, that is the appropriate and routine approach for provisions of a technical nature. Mr Ferguson's amendment presents difficulties in terms of compliance with the Technical Standards Directive and prejudges the outcome of a consultation process, which I have already committed to. Crucially, if any submission to the European Commission were rejected, I think, as the, as the Member has acknowledged, then the entire section of the Bill could be rendered ultra viris and thereby invalidated. Now, I take the point that he has made, I'm sorry, that the Member has made in relation to whether the, 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 the section would have any validity at all, and I accept that he has a position on that. But the Government has taken a view we would rather not have that section of the Bill fall. The risk of rejection may be low, but we should not take this risk and instead follow due process, in my opinion. I recognise that many people have views about what the carcass tagging scheme should look like and how it should operate. A key issue will be whether it should make use of an individual number of tags and create record recording requirements. I am aware of the uh, Basic Committee's members' views, including members from my own benches, on this issue, and I have also listened to Mr Ferguson's points today. I have already committed to full consultation of the scheme and can confirm that numbered tags and recording will be an option set out in the consultation. Other issues to be considered are how the scheme will be administered, how it will be funded and how it will be enforced. I look forward to engaging with stakeholders, including the Scottish Parliament, on this issue. And there are differing opinions about the scheme, and we must engage. If I could just finish briefly uh, about the scheme, and we must engage across the sector to deliver a scheme that is fit for purpose and proportionate. Consultation will commence this calendar year, and I will bring regulations to Parliament before next year's summer recess. I give way to Mr. Ferguson. Alex Ferguson. Yes, I can, Minister. I appreciate the fact that I think you are bringing the time scale timetable for consultation forward, and I appreciate that if that is the case, but you, you said that a, a numbered, an, an individual numbered scheme would be an option. Can you, are you able to say that it will be the principal option that will be consulted upon? Minister. I'm happy to confirm. I, I believe that there is a logic to having number tags, and I, I mentioned this at stage two of the, uh, the committee, that I felt there was no technical reason why number tags uh, would not be possible, but we do have to consult with stakeholders and take their views as to whether this is the appropriate way of, of, of dealing with the problem. Uh, so I certainly see it, I see it as being a key measure within the consultation exercise, and uh, there will potentially be others. Uh, we can't close the options off at this stage, but clearly recognising the reviews of the committee and the chamber, uh, I would see that being the key, key part of the consultation. I hope if I have offered sufficient reassurance to Mr Ferguson on that point and other members that the issue of number tags and recording will be considered fully as part of the process of developing secondary legislation. And on that basis, Presiding Officer, and for the technical reasons I mentioned earlier, I ask Mr Ferguson to recognise the commitment I have given today to the Chamber and not to press Amendment 4. In the interest of conservation, I am of course supportive of a strict regulation on the trade of wild salmon. Amendment 5 seeks to add the word by to the offence associated with carcass tagging, and this would make no material difference uh, to the offence as the term possession, already included in the provision, covers possession as a result of purchase. If Mr Ferguson wishes to see greater consistency and comprehensive uh, offence provisions around the trade of wild salmon, I consider there are more suitable vehicles in this amendment. For example, a conservation regulation could be made to prohibit the sale of all rod-caught salmon, and I am happy to consider the option further and to engage with him and the committee on our proposal should we progress it. And, presiding officer, I therefore ask Mr Ferguson not to press Amendment 5. Thank you very much. Mr Ferguson, to wind up and press withdraw his amendment. Um, I, I said I would listen very carefully to what the Minister said, and I did, and I'm grateful to him for taking an intervention, and he has said enough in that intervention to satisfy me that uh, a, an individually numbered, tagged, and recorded scheme will be a central part of the consultation that's to come. I would therefore not intend to move uh, Amendment 4 in my name, Presiding Officer. Um, however, I do intend to press Amendment 5, because I think it is important to have consistency in any legislation, and I would propose uh, I don't think this is the right time to do so, but when asked, I intend to propose Amendment 5. Thank you very much.
So Mr Ferguson seeks to withdraw Amendment 4. Does any member object? As no member objects, Amendment 4 is therefore withdrawn. And I call Amendment 5 in the name of Alex Ferguson, already debated with Amendment 4, Mr Ferguson to move or not move? Moved. Thank you. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 5 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. This will be a one-minute division. The result of the vote on amendment number 5 is yes 42, no 64. There were no abstentions and the amendment is therefore not agreed. We now move to group 7, monitoring and evaluating the effects of orders, etc. penalties for offences. I call amendment 6 in the name of Alex Ferguson, group with amendment 7. Mr Ferguson, to move as quickly as you can. Amendment 6 and speak to both amendments in the group, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Section 25 of this bill allows districts and officially boards to be criminalised for failing to monitor the effects of an order. One of the points I made at stage two was that the level of penalty that the Scottish Government is proposing could have a deterrent effect, especially for some individuals who might wish to involve themselves in some of the smaller boards across the country. The Minister was then at pains to point out that the impact could only be on boards as a whole rather than on any, any individual. But I would draw his attention to section 25, page 28, line 27, which states a board which all proprietor who commits an offence will be impacted by this. So I have to differ on that point, but my purpose, presiding officer, in tabling these amendments is not to protect either a board or an individual. It is simply to seek a degree of proportionality in the level of penalty that is to be applied. A level four penalty, as is suggested in the bill, is the lowest that can be applied to an altern as an alternative to a custodial sentence. In other words, the alternative would be prison. It is normally applied to offences which pose in the words of Spice, more appreciable and culpable risks to health and safety, such as careless driving using a mobile phone while driving an HGV or speeding on a motorway. The equivalent custodial sentence, I say, is around three months' imprisonment. With the best will in the world, presiding officer, I don't think you can equate the failure to monitor the effects of an order with serious misdemeanours such as careless driving and using a mobile phone while driving an HGV. I would therefore appeal to the Minister this last time on an amendment in my name to let his sensitive side come out this afternoon and in doing so, hopefully bring a much more realistic degree of proportionality to the crime that we are about to establish. I thank you. Stir sensitively, please. <laughs> um, well, I, I, I will show great sensitivity. I, I, I feel Mr Ferguson's pain. Presiding officer, monitoring and evaluation of management measures is a fundamental, fundamental element in fisheries management, and I wish to make clear my expectation that monitoring be built into any case for statutory measures and how else can efficacy be judged and practice shared. It is right there is a sanction for failure to comply with monitoring requirements. That sanction must act as a deterrent to committing the offence. However, I have listened uh, to Mr Ferguson's arguments about the appropriate level of fine and reflected in where the offence sits in relation to Scottish Government guidance. On balance and uh, with the power of argument that has been made by Mr Ferguson, I accept Mr Ferguson's view and therefore recommend that Amendments 6 and 7 be agreed. Thank you very much. Alex Ferguson to wind up and press to withdraw his amendment. Um, I, I'm so overcome by the Minister's sensitivity, I'm so, totally overcome by the sensitivity shown by the Minister that I have nothing further to say other than to express my gratitude. Thank you. Thank you very much. I take it that you're pressing your amendment in that case. And the question is that Amendment 6 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. Similarly, we, we are agreed, uh, I hope. I call Amendment 7 in the name of Alex Ferguson, already debated with Amendment 6. Mr Ferguson, to move or not move? Move, presiding officer. Thank you. The question is that Amendment 7 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
we are all agreed. We now move to section group 8, uh, which is the Crown application of the 2003 Act in the Bill. And I call Amendment 28 in the name of the Minister, grouped with Amendments 42, 43 and 44. The Minister to move Amendment 28 and speak to all amendments in the group. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And I know after an hour and a half, almost a debate, uh, members will be on the edge of their seats at this stage. Uh, but I must apologise in advance that Group 8 covers a number of technical amendments uh, that deal with Crown application. Her Majesty's private office are aware of them. Uh, by its nature, these are particularly dry subject. However, I have signalled in my letter uh, of the 8th of May to the convener of the Iraqi Committee my intention to bring forward amendments to clarify the application of salmon and freshwater fisheries legislation to the Crown. Crown application is a matter determined on a case-by-case -case basis in the context of policy needs. The Crown, in all its forms, owns and manages a number of salmon fisheries in Scotland. It is therefore important, in the interests of national consisten consistency, that salmon and fisheries legislation applies to the Crown and Crown land. The 2003 Act makes some provision for Crown application, but it is desirable that the section is reworked to aid understanding and enforcement of the law. Amendment 28 applies to the 2003 Act to the Crown and to Crown land. This means that offences apply in relation to Crown land and those in the public service of the Crown can be held liable. Statutory provision is made in relation to exercising access rights to Her Majesty's private estates. Those appointed by Scottish Ministers to carry out sampling or investigation activity under Section 64 of the Act will be required to obtain written permission where access is required to the private estates. These provisions give statutory effect to administrative arrangements. The requirement to obtain written permission will also apply to bailiff's powers of entry, providing clarity around local enforcement of the legislation. It is at this point, uh, in particular, Presiding Officer, that I must ask my colleagues across the Chamber for their forbearance uh, as I put the following on the record. I might even say listen carefully, as I shall say this only once, for all our sakes. Um, Section, indeed, uh, you picked it up well, Mr. Johnston. Section 55, one of the bill provides immunity from prosecution. By spared uh, Mr. Allard the accent, uh, prosecution for the crown. Amendment 42 provides that the immunity does not extend to public servants of the crown. This applies to the standalone offences created by or under the bill. These are mainly related to agriculture issues, and the provision brings consistency of approach to the bill in terms of crown liability. Amendment 43 removes Section 55.3 of the Bill, which amends uh, Section 67 of the 2003 Act. Since Section 67 is rewritten and inserted into the 2003 Act by Amendment 28, Section 55.3 is no longer necessary. And Amendment 44, which removes a cross-reference to Section 55.3, is consequential on Amendment 43. Presiding Officer, after that, it may be a blessed release to colleagues when I say I move Amendment 28. Very much. And I call Mr. Ferguson briefly, please. Um, I can be very briefly, Presiding Officer. Again, I have absolutely no issue with the outcome and the intention of um, this section, this group, this amendment, or indeed the other ones that are to come. Where I have a, a, where I have a concern about this is that the normal scrutiny, scrutineering processes of the committee have been bypassed in the introduction of this group, and for that reason, I won't rehearse the arguments that have already been rehearsed, but for that reason alone, I cannot simply allow uh, this, uh, these measures to be um, nodded through. Thank you very much. Minister, to wind up. Um, similarly, I, I take the view that um, I, I accept Mr Ferguson's view about the, the consultation and the need to make sure Parliament has its, its say on this issue, and I'm happy to uh, let it take its course. The question is that Amendment 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. Please vote now. One minute division.
The result of the vote in Amendment No. 28 is yes, 60, no, 0. There are 45 abstentions, and the amendment is therefore agreed. And we now move to Group 9, which is the power to charge in connection with fisheries functions. We call Amendment 29 in the name of Tavish Scott, Group with amendments 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37 and 38. Mr Scott, to move Amendment 29 and speak to all amendments in the group, please. I'm grateful, uh, Presiding Officer. Uh, this uh, debate is simply about the Minister and the Government taking powers to charge for services uh, that will now uh, be done by various uh, agencies of government, notably Marine Scotland. And as we know, and those of us who have dealt with this over some years now, Marine Scotland has three quite distinct functions, notably regulation and enforcement policy uh, and research. Uh, and the contention and the concern of many uh, across the industry is that in uh, instigating this charging regi regime, there is an inherent conflict of interest in respect uh, of the uh, of government uh, and its agencies, and therefore there is a need for transparency, and that is what my um amendments uh, seek to do. There are two other practical points. The first is that, of course, the industry can procure uh, some services from other sources. It, it does not need to just uh, buy in those services uh, from government. And there is uh, considerable concern uh, that the way in which the bill is now drafted means that, in effect, uh, there will be no choice about that. It is that the government will uh, state these are the uh, services and functions that have to be uh, undertaken and that we will charge for them in that particular way. Uh, and that is uh, that. So that's I uh, seek, in particular in 37, to ensure that there's some transparency in that process. Uh, and the final point I'd want to make is that on, for example, the Fils Fish Health Inspectorate, which of course plays an important uh, role, but is one of those three functions within Marine Scotland, which, as I say, I think creates a a uh, pretty clear conflict of interest. Um, it can, of course, uh, under the measures, charge for services not underpinned by statute or secondary legislation or indeed uh, ministerial order, because the government, again, is taking very considerable powers here in respect to this bill, uh, which will come through, as the minister was gracious to admit, through secondary uh, legislation, uh, which uh, this parliament will scrutinise a lot less, I rather suspect, uh, than in formal primary uh, legislation. So there seem to me some uh, basic points of transparency Transparency, which are important in the context of government taking powers uh, to charge an industry for services that, he, that it, the government, is providing. Uh, and my amendments seek to uh, ensure that transparency is there and some clarity in that process. Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I, I, I must admit, I have to confess some surprise that we have been asked to consider these amendments. Uh, again, lodged by Tavis Scott, but I, I hear what he says regarding the, um, the concerns about scrutiny. I have previously explained our position and provided several reassurance about our commitment to consultation and any proposals going forward. Indeed, through a government lodged amendment, we endorsed uh, the, the Iraqi Committee and Subordinate Legislation Committee's recommendation that any regulations emerging from these powers would be subject to affirmative procedure. Uh, during Stage 2 consideration of the Bill, uh, Mr Scott helpfully outlined the purpose behind these amendments, namely that he considered that the three functions of Marine Scotland, enforcement, regulation, scientific research and policy, were very distinct and needed to be dealt with separately in any proposed charging regime. Otherwise, he suggested there would be a self-evident conflict of interest. I do not necessarily agree with that view, but what is clear, as I have said before, is that the basis for any charging regime will be informed through consultation, which is provided for in section 55. As I have already previously outlined, the primary purpose of these provisions is to promote the effective use of resources. Any charges payable under regulations made using this power may only require a person to pay a charge if and so far as the person is someone in relation to whom a fisheries function, that is functions under any legislation relating to fish farming or shellfish farming, uh, salmon or freshwater fisheries and sea fishing has actually been carried out. It also encompasses enforcement and compliance. Fundamentally, the charge may not exceed the reasonable cost incurred in the carrying out of the function. The charge, uh, therefore, must relate to the function in respect of which it is charged and may not generate a surplus. I'll take an attention. Yeah, I'm Scott. grateful for that clarity. Would the Minister also reflect on the point, or has he had a chance to reflect on the point about industry procuring services in a, from a different source? Would he reflect on that in his comments here today? Minister. I, I certainly uh, noted the comments that Mr Scott has made, and uh, I, I'm aware that there was, there was only one uh, substantive uh, response to this issue during the consultation, and you know, the, the issue actually covers a lot 
wider area than the, the particular respondent uh, who, who came back on it. Uh, so there wasn't any degree of concern uh, other than uh, through the one, the one response. Um, but I will, I will certainly ensure that uh, we have clarity on, on those issues for, for Mr Scott. Amendment 38 is, is, is also familiar to me from stage two. Um, again, Mr Scott seeks to place a requirement on the face of the bill for ministers to conduct a review and then prepare and publish a report on the operation of any regulation within a specific, specific time period. Um, while I fully agree that any new regulation should be reviewed, uh, I do not think the parameters of that process should be determined or restricted before any wider policy development and public consultation has taken place. So, presiding officer, I urge members to resist amendments 29 through to 38. Thank you very much. And Mr Scott, to wind up and press to withdraw your amendments. Well, Mr. Arias, I do think there's a pretty fundamental point about government taking these paths, and I think that is why, in the uh, circumstances we're in in Parliament today, there should be an onus, uh, in, uh, and we have no alternative but to try and seek to lay this in primary legislation, uh, to uh, instigate a reporting mechanism that does allow for the transparency and the clarity uh, that I seek to achieve in this. And therefore, uh, because the uh, Minister also uh, has only reflected on the point about different sources, and I'm told there are potentially um, considerable ways in which to uh, do that. I would have hoped for a stronger answer on that particular point. I am going to press uh, this amendment because I do believe it's an important principle that we should, we should adopt here. Thank you very much. And so the question is that Amendment 29 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a division. This will be a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on amendment number 29 is yes, 17, no, 88. There were no abstentions, and the amendment is therefore not agreed. And I call amendment 30 in the name of Tavish Scott, already debated with amendment 29. Mr Scott, to move or not move? So I officer to help, I'll withdraw the rest in this group. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'm afraid I will still need to call them, and you will tell me that you will not move them. So I call Amendment 31 in the name of Tavish Scott. Mr Scott, to move or not move? Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 32 in the name of Tavish Scott. Not move. Thank you. Call Amendment 3 in the name of Tavish Scott. Will not suffice. Thank you. <laughs> call Amendment 34 in the name of Tavish Scott. Not moved. Thank you. Amendment 35 in the name of Tavish Scott. Not moved. Thank you. Amendment 36 in the name of Tavish Scott. Not moved. Thank you. Amendment 37 in the name of Tavish Scott. Not moved. Thank you. Amendment 38 in the name of Tavish Scott. Not moved. Signing off, sir. Thank you very much. And so, we, as we are once again nearing the agreed time limit under Rule 9.8.4a, I consider it necessary to allow the debate on this group to continue beyond the limit in order to avoid the debate being unreasonably curtailed. And we are therefore now at Group 10, which is fixed penalty notices. And I call Amendment 39 in the name of the Minister. Group of Amendments 40 and 41. Minister, to move Amendment 39 and speak to all amendments in the group, please, Minister. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, amendments 39 and 41 bring offences associated with the control of well boat activities in Section 55 of the Bill within the scope of the fixed penalty notice regime under the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Act 2007, as amended by this Bill. Well boats used in aquaculture treatments are one of a number of marine activities routinely licensed under Part 4 of the Marine uh, Scotland Act 2010. To complete the enforcement regime, therefore, these amendments also bring marine licensing offences within the scope of the fixed penalty regime. 
Pitch penalty notices are issued providing the option of a non-court disposal in advance of prosecution. If the fixed penalty notice is not paid within the deadline set, then a report is submitted to the Procurator Fiscal. The 2010 Act, which also provides civil sanctions for marine licensing infringement, is also amended to add in safeguards which prevent civil penalties being imposed in circumstances where a fixed penalty notice has been offered. These amendments complement and complete other measures taken in this Bill and help ensure that we will have robust well-boat controls and wider marine management measures, yet at the same time provide options for operators to deal with their business regulatory non-compliance out with the criminal justice system. Amendment 40 is a minor drafting amendment to correct a reference in the provisions to the 2007 Act. So, Presiding Officer, I move Amendment 39. Thank you very much. Alex Ferguson, briefly, please. Well, again, Presiding Officer, sadly, this is the third group that the um, Government has chosen to introduce without proper um, committee scrutiny. Um, I don't need to go over all the arguments. I get the impression the Minister rather regrets the fact that he's had to introduce these measures in this way. Again, we don't disagree with the outcome, but um, uh, on a point of principle, I simply cannot let them go unopposed. Thank you very much. Minister, to wind up. Uh, thank you, Presiding Officer. Just one point to make uh, that these, these amendments are consistent uh, with the basis in which we consulted in respect of other fixed penalty notices. So I appreciate the point that Mr Ferguson makes, but the general principle of how they are applied has been consulted on. Thank you. And so the question is that Amendment 39 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We are not agreed. There will there be a division. This will be a one-minute division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in Amendment No. 39 is yes, 59, no, 1, and there were 45 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. I call Amendments 40, 41, 42, 43 and 44, all in the name of the Minister and all previously debated, and invite the Minister to move the Amendments 40 to 44 on block. Well, thank you very much. And so the question is that Amendment 40 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will therefore be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in Amendment No. 40 is yes, 59, no, 1. There were 45 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 41 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? No. We are not agreed. There will therefore be a 30-second division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in Amendment No. 41 is yes, 59. There were no votes, no, and there are 46 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. 
The next question is that Amendment 42 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. And there will therefore be a division. Please vote now. The result of the vote on Amendment No. 42 is yes, 59, no, 0, and there were 46 abstentions. The amendment is therefore agreed. The next question is that Amendment 43 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed. There will therefore be division. Please vote now. The result of the vote in Amendment No. 43 is yes, 59. There were no votes against and there were 45 abstentions, and the amendment is therefore agreed. And the final vote in this section is the question is that Amendment 44. Are we all agreed? We are not agreed, therefore this is the final division. The result of the vote in Amendment No. 44 is yes, 57, no, 0, and there were 46 abstentions, and the amendment is therefore agreed. And that ends consideration of amendments. Thank you all very much. The next site of business is a debate on motion number S4M 06544 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse on the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Bill. Before I invite Paul Wheelhouse to open the debate, I call on the Cabinet Secretary to signify Crown consent to the Bill. Richard Lockhead. <coughs> Thank you, President Officer. I thought members might have hung about for the highlights, but can I just say that for the purposes of Rule 9.11 of Standing Orders, I wish to advise the Parliament that Her Majesty, having been informed of the purport of the Agriculture and Fisheries Scotland Bill, has consented to place her prerogative and interests so far as they are affected by the Bill at the disposal of the Parliament for the purposes of the Bill. Thank you, Cabinet Secretary. Um, members who wish to speak in the debate should press the request to speak button now. And can I say that we are quite tight for time. Uh, I call on Paul Wheelhouse to speak to move the motion. Minister, you have got nine minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I am pleased to open this Stage 3 debate on the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Bill. At the outset, my thanks go to the Rural Affairs, Climate Change and Environment Committee uh, for its thorough consideration of the Bill. I thank all, those, all, of, all of those who provided written and oral evidence to the Committee, as well as those who responded to the Government consultations, and everyone who has worked with us throughout the legislative process, including our stakeholder reference group. 
My thanks are also due to the subordinate legislation committee for its scrutiny and its reports on the bill. I also place on record my thanks to the Scottish Government officials, in particular those in the bill team, who have worked extremely hard to bring the bill to this point today. And I must say I thoroughly enjoyed taking my first bill through the Parliament. It was a bit uh, ropey at points when Mr Ferguson questioning me, but uh, I'm glad I got there. I'm sure that every member in this chamber will agree that Scotland is fortunate in having a thriving, very kind of you, Mr Ferguson, uh, very fortunate in having a thriving aquaculture industry, world-renowned salmon fishing rivers and a diverse marine and coastal environment. This places a responsibility in all of us to ensure that our marine ecosystems continue to provide economic, social and wider benefits for people, industry and society. This responsibility underpins the primary purpose of the Bill, which is to ensure that farmed and wild fisheries and their interactions with each other continue to be managed effectively as both sectors thrive. Critically, we wish to maximise their combined contribution to supporting sustainable economic growth in rural areas, but with due regard to the wider marine environment. There are many varied interests that use and enjoy Scotland's marine environment, and the quality of the environment is a key element of the market appeal of farmed salmon, trout and shellfish. Maintaining this pristine, shared pristine marine environment requires good neighbourliness. Last week, I chaired the first meeting of the refreshed Ministerial Group for Sustainable Agriculture, and I hope and believe that that group will continue to be a forum where such consensus on shared issues can be reached. I have formed an interaction, uh, interactions working group as part of the MGSA, and I believe this represents a new opportunity to move the shared agenda forward and to put aside some of the friction of the past. I expect it to establish closer, productive working relationships between wild and farm fish interests, both locally and Scotland-wide, and to consider more broadly the significant benefits that both sectors can bring to rural and remote communities. And what do those benefits equate to? Well, we are dealing with a £600 million aquaculture sector, employing some 1,800 people in aquaculture production and almost 3,000 salmon processing. Similarly, game and course angling supports 2,800 full-time equivalent jobs and is worth £134 million in expenditure to the Scottish economy. Much has been said, not least by the Iraqi Committee, about the individual interests and positions taken by stakeholders. I believe it highlights the need to ensure we get things right. It also underlines our intention to balance the interests of many in the public interest rather than responding in isolation to single-issue campaigns. The Rural Affairs Committee, among others, have asked for the reassurance that the Scottish Government has actively engaged with stakeholders around the provisions in this Bill. I can confirm that this is indeed the case. Stakeholder engagement has been an important part of our work since the consultation began and will continue long after the provisions of this Bill have been implemented. For example, the Wellboats Working Group has recently been established. Members of the group include wellboat operators, um, representatives of the fish farming companies, academics, the RSPCA in, in respect of their uh, Freedom Food Assurance Scheme and the Code of uh, Good Practice Management Committee. This specialist group will work to establish the technical requirements for filters to control sea lice in all wellboats operating in Scotland and the facilities needed for the new bigger wellboats which will be used in future. Colleagues have on occasion thrown, I'm sure with good intent, uh, what might usually be described as a lifeline to save me from what they consider the unintended consequences of the bill. Uh, while I'm always grateful for any such well-intentioned uh, efforts to save me from danger, um, I consider that on these occasions they have not been required. This bill has been developed over a considerable period of time with substantial input from others. It has rightly been subject to considerable scrutiny from the Parliament, and I can assure you that we have given very serious consideration to and acted on the issues raised in formulating our own amendments. It is, in my opinion, fit for purpose. Part 1 of the Bill strengthens the regulatory framework for the fin fish sector of the industry. Our aim is to support the industry as it continues to deliver its sustainable growth, using a 2011 baseline of 50% in volume to 2020 and beyond, and that means a further 32% growth uh, from now. During the passage of the Bill, it was suggested that the uh, provisions in respect of farm management agreements were tantamount to micromanaging uh, salmon farms. Uh, I see Tavish Scott is unfortunately not here. But while I share the desire to avoid micromanaging the sector that um, uh, Tavish Scott has set out, I have not been convinced by that argument and believe the Bill would not result in this occurring. I, I stand behind my conviction the Bill is balanced and proportionate. The provisions require all fish farms in a farm management area to be party to a farm management agreement or a farm management statement. These agreements or statements must specify arrangements for a number of critical matters relating to fish health and welfare, namely fish health management, management of parasites, the movement of live fish on and off farms, 
the harvesting of fish and the following of the farms after harvesting. At present, 98% of fish farms are signed up to the Industry Code of Good Practice and are parties to agreements or statements. If the bill is passed today, the provisions will apply to all marine fin fish or farm operators and set the criteria which we consider are essential for managing the health of farmed uh, fish within an area. The issue of public reporting of sea lice has been discussed at considerable length during the progress of this bill and again today, and clearly it is an issue of great concern to members, and I fully recognise that. I hope the members would agree that we have clearly and consistently explained the Government's position, even if you don't agree with it uh, across the Chamber. We remain convinced that voluntary public reporting is the right route, and that the proposals the SSPO have uh, committed to take forward, and which they helpfully reaffirmed in a recent communication with uh, MSPs, are appropriate from all perspectives. Uh, transparency, compliance, science and justifiable commercial interest. However, I repeat my commitment that I gave earlier on to review the success or otherwise of this voluntary arrangement within the current session of Parliament. Crucially, we already have the powers under the 2007 Act to implement a mandatory reporting arrangement should that prove necessary. Part 2 of the Bill improves the governance of district salmon fisheries boards and strengthens the management of salmon fisheries. These are the first steps in delivering our manifesto commitment to modernise the management structures for salmon and freshwater fisheries. This is a complex area and one which has been the subject of numerous reports and investigations over the years. The committee took considerable interest in the issues which need further work in this area and I provided what I hope were helpful comments on what the forthcoming review should cover. Work is underway to scope the independent review that will be undertaken. I intend that it will commence this summer, and I look forward to engaging with colleagues across the Chamber of Parliament and all interested parties on this piece of work. Part 4 of the Bill introduces provisions to ensure the continued protection of good water quality necessary for a sustainable shellfish industry. This is a sector that we believe has potential, if managed with sensitivity to the environment, uh, with the shellfish industry and in especially with respect to mussels, looking to expand from a 2011 baseline by 100% by 2020, and that's another 80% growth from now. Work is already underway to build on these provisions with the aim of consulting on draft regulations for introduction in the autumn. The regulations will introduce a system of quality standards which bring together environmental standards for good water quality and food hygiene standards required for high quality shellfish products, and it will be a first in Europe. And this will help to cement Scotland's reputation for the quality of its produce. It is a rare treat for any minister to be praised uh, by the opposition for bringing forward legislation, so I shall treasure Alex Ferguson's uh, contribution in the committee's consideration of the Solway Cockles provisions. However, this reflects the very genuine consensus that there is a serious issue that merits uh, government action. I was pleased to see the widespread coverage in the media of the police and Maine Scotland officers stepping up the patrols to tackle illegal cockling on the Solway Firth. I am sure we would all rather see people being deterred from illegal and potentially uh, dangerous cockling than have to use the powers we are seeking to take in this bill, but regrettably it has proved necessary for us to take decisive steps to address it. It would be remiss of me, perhaps, while speaking about Solway cockles, not to mention the wider improvements in the enforcement measures that are included in the bill. The Fisheries Act of 1705 uh, makes certain provisions for the good subjects of this kingdom, uh, the people of Scotland, to fish in the seas around our coastline. And this act of the old Scottish Parliament perhaps underlines how important Scotland's seas are to the people of Scotland. Minister, I need you to bring your remarks to a close. Oh, apologies, uh, Presiding Officer. Effective monitoring and enforcement of marine and fishing laws is vital, and if we are to protect Scotland's valuable marine areas and fisheries to benefit not only the many fisheries dependent communities we have around the Scottish coast, I think this, this bill uh, is essential to deliver those steps. Thank you very much. Thank you, Minister. I now call Claudia Beamish. Ms Beamish, I can give you no more than six minutes. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Scottish Labour recognises the significance and importance of this bill, regulation and the wild fisheries review in terms of present and future employment in what are often fragile rural and coastal communities. Jobs in wild fisheries, scientific research, aquaculture itself, and of course in fish processing, retailing and exporting. An excellent example of how the whole, the whole production chain can be vertically integrated is that of the cooperative uh, Scottish shellfish, giving the customer reassurance about provenance. This is very important in the wake of the horsemeat scandal from which lessons must be learned. Spice tells us that Scotland is already the largest salmon producer in the EU and the third largest in the world after Norway and Chile. I have looked with interest at the Cabinet Secretary's drive to promote exports in Scottish salmon and shellfish. Salmon is Scotland's largest food export, accounting for a third of the value of all food exports. Scottish salmon is exported to over 50 countries, with the EU and US markets being particularly important. A new market opened up in China after agreement with the Chinese government was reached, as the Minister and Cabinet Secretary will know, in 2011. 
Figures show that exports from salmon to the Far East went up from 682 tonnes in 2010 to 8,675 tonnes in 2012. While there is little doubt about the highly lucrative nature of the exports in short term for Scotland, can the Minister clarify how this drive in exports can be reconciled with the Scottish Government's commitment to sustainable seas? The Cabinet Secretary has stated that the Scottish salmon industry is committed to nurturing a responsible and sustainable and environmentally aware future based on strong fishing heritages and traditions. Clean waters are, as the Minister has said, uh, pristine or, in my words, quintessential. This drives us forward to the environmental imperative. The diversity of our seas and sea locks, rivers and burns is fundamental to our very future and the future of species and habitats for which we have responsibility. And sustainable development is the key. Today I seek further assurances from the Minister that in spite of the failure of the Bill's policy memorandum to fulfil its potential in this regard, that if the, if the Bill becomes an Act today, uh, that there will be a continuing assessment of sustainable development. Scotland's marine uh, plan, which as we all know has been delayed, is fundamental in underpinning the way forward as well. And this summer's consultations, of course, relate to sustainable development, not just for those employment opportunities I highlighted in relation to this bill, but how other industries in the marine sectors, which I don't have time to list today, can all fit together and be taken forward in a sustainable way. At stage one, I stressed I quote, all, all potential development in our seas must be judged in the context of the marine carrying capacity. Scottish Government must, I, I, I point out, always remember that our Marine Act of 2010 gives us legally binding obligation to enhance our seas, and this sets the responsibility to recover damaged species as well as to maintain the status quo. At stage one, I highlighted the significance of climate change and now ask the Minister in his closing remarks to give the Chamber and all interested groups reassurance that the Bill and ensuing re regulations will be climate change proofed and how this will be monitored. The review of the marine protected areas in 2018 will also be very significant as the science develops. The health of our rivers and burns is also in need of protection for the same reasons as our seas. Can the Minister tell the Chamber today how future funding will be made available for the range of initiatives needed, such as the de-planting um, scheme, which we visited with the Committee? In terms of wild fisheries, the recent, rod, the recent increase in, catch, so in rod catch, coupled with the high levels of catch and release, is regarded as evidence of increases in numbers of fish entering fresh waters. However, there is still a concern about spring salmon. And as a sea trout champion, I also have concerns about the decline in numbers which Marine Scotland has identified. To move forward sustainably, science is essential and must be shared. How can science be shared uh, if it is not fully publicly available to share between Marine Scotland, academia and the range of industries? An honest and full assessment of the industry is needed if we are going to achieve our shared aquaculture targets and our shellfish targets. Scottish Labour is disappointed and frankly perplexed by the final position in the Bill on the sea lice publication of, of data. I note the Minister's comments, which are in some sense reassuring, uh, but there should, in my view, still be the overriding principle of transparency. Our seas are not private property. More broadly, whatever waste comes from fish farms does not stop at the barrier of the cage any more than the diffuse farm pollution stops at the fence near a burn. The development of effective regulation accompanying this bill and the Wild Fisheries Review and the Ministerial Group on Aquaculture will be the make or break of future sustainable activity. The Minister's words today are reassuring on this. Further, that stage one recommendation of the committee is important that if there are breakdowns of relationship, full and accessible and fit for purpose mediation services I must are ask you to bring your remarks to close. I will. Thank you, Presiding Officer. In the building of good relationships is perhaps more important than anything else and an absolute imperative for the future. <coughs> Scottish Labour supports the Bill and I ask the Minister for reassurance that support in nurturing these relationships will be a priority in the future. Thank you. I now call on Alex Ferguson. Mr Ferguson, you've got up to four minutes. 
Thank you, Presiding Officer. The passage of this bill has been a long and arduous process, and I would like to begin my brief contribution at Stage 3, as I did in the Stage 1 debate, by thanking the clerks of the committee who have made that process much easier and considerably more enjoyable than it might otherwise have been. We heard and read an enormous amount of evidence at Stage 1, and if I've got one main regret about where we are today, it's that the bill does not perhaps do more to reflect some of the serious issues that I think we all basically agreed on during the Stage 1 proceedings. I suspect it was bound to be thus because, as the committee said in its stage one report, the Scottish Government, and I quote, could have been clearer in its consultation document in order to better manage understanding and expectations amongst stakeholders and the wider public. I do not recall the Government ever disagreeing with that statement. But the result was that amongst a range of stakeholders, expectations were probably raised to an unachievable level. And that's probably not a great way, a very helpful way in which to embark on a bill. The Minister described the bill to the committee as future-proofing the industry in light of the current growth targets and potential new operators coming to Scotland. Now, while there is much that I welcome in the bill, I fear that those words will almost certainly come back to haunt him. And I say that not to disparage either the bill or indeed the Minister in any way, but to highlight the missed opportunities that I think are inherent within it. For instance, the opportunity to have lanced once and for all the boil that is the publication of sea lice data. That opportunity has been missed, full stop. Yes, the industry has shifted in position, and I welcome that, but I suspect it hasn't done so enough to satisfy the NGOs, organisations and individuals that have called for it in the past and will continue to do so. And frankly, why shouldn't they? The first voluntary publication of a report on sea lice management and control that was agreed by the industry and the minister should have been published last Monday, that being six weeks uh, uh, after the end of the first reporting period. And by one o'clock this afternoon, it had not been published. You can read into that what you will. This issue will simply not go away with the passage of this bill, and I do think Parliament has missed a huge opportunity to address it more realistically when it rejected Claudia Beamish's amendment this afternoon. I think a properly worked up tagging scheme should have been on the face of the bill, but I take the Minister at his word and I look forward to what he comes forward with for the consultation. Sadly, I don't think this bill is going to do very much, if anything, to bring the wild fish sector and the farm fish sector closer together. And that was a desired aim of the bill. And it's a real shame, frankly, because a continued standoff is in no one's interest at all and is certainly not in the interest of our inshore marine environment. I have no doubt at all that these issues will have to be returned to, and I fear probably sooner rather than later. That said, I want to finish on a positive note, Presiding Officer, and I very much welcome the inclusion at Stage 2, as the Minister has already mentioned, of measures to toughen up actions that can be taken against suspected illegal cockle poachers, principally along the Solway coast. That has been long awaited and is greatly welcomed. Although it will not solve the problem, I believe only the creation of a legal fishery will achieve that. It heralds a vast improvement from where we are today. I thank the Government for taking the opportunity to introduce these measures on the back of this Bill, and on that hopefully positive note, Presiding Officer, I am pleased to say that we will be supporting this Bill at decision time this evening. Despite my reservations about the Government's introductions of substantive sections at Stage 3, this by thus bypassing parliamentary scrutiny, I would congratulate the Minister on steering his first Bill through Parliament, and, he thinks that, and if he thinks that I give him a tough time in questions, I would only say I suspect he ain't seen nothing yet. We now move to a very short open debate. Uh, I'm afraid that, uh, to be able to call all the members, I can't give you any more than three minutes, and if you can confine your remarks to less than that, I'd be most grateful. Angus MacDonald, followed by Eileen Murray. Thank you, President Officer. As a relatively new member of the RAC Committee, I'm pleased to have been able to take part in the whole scrutiny process from the start of this Bill. Um, I'll, skip to my, I'll skip my preamble, uh, given the constraints uh, of time. Uh, and go direct to the issue of carcass tagging, and I'm pleased to acknowledge the Minister's commitment to consult fully on the issue. Uh, I also note the Minister's recent explanation to the Committee that had the amendment which sought to include the requirement for carcass tags to be individually numbered been successful, it would have restricted the Scottish Government's ability to progress regulations which adequately reflect the differing views from stakeholders, both in terms of application and potential impact on business. He also said at stage two that any specific requirement would be subject to the EU Technical Standards Directive, which would mean that the European Commission may need to be notified if it created a technical barrier to trade, which would result in a standstill period of 18 months before the measure could come into effect, impacting on the whole bill. 
So although I note uh, Alex Ferguson's failure to be convinced by the EU Technical Standards Directive argument, even though uh, he withdrew uh, Amendment 4 in Group 6, uh, I would, however, ask the Minister to detail when the consultation on carcass tagging with stakeholders will be complete, um, and had hoped uh, that there would be a clear and ambiguous statement from the Minister today that any subsequent system will use individually numbered tags and that the system will be in place for the start of the 2014 season. I know they gave a commitment that it would be an option, however, the committee was seeking further assurances. The committee spent considerable time looking at the public reporting of sea lice data, and we noted that during Stage 2, the Minister confirmed the Scottish Salmon Producers Organisation's plans to increase the voluntary public reporting of sea lice data from the current six areas to 30, and the Minister's comment that the SSPO's voluntary proposal was a significant development and an appropriate balance between public reassurance and commercial interests at this time. In addition, the SSPO confirmed that they would provide Marine Scotland with access to sea lice data at farm management area level. Now, I recognise there was considerable disappointment from a number of stakeholders, such as the Association of Salmon Fisheries Boards, who would have preferred publication of all sea lice data on a farm-by-farm -farm basis. However, I'm encouraged by the Minister's commitment this afternoon to review the success or otherwise of this voluntary arrangement within the current session of Parliament. Uh, with this in mind, I, w I welcome the formation of the Ministerial Group. You must bring your remarks to a close. Okay, thank you, Convener. Um, President Officer, we should never lose sight of the fact that uh, whether it be farmed or wild salmon, this is a good news story for Scotland. Whether it's angling on Royal Deeside or salmon farming in the Western Isles, we have a lot to thank the humble salmon for. However, it's clear that the excellent prospects of the aquaculture industry can only be realised if the industry observes the best environmental, husbandry and governance standards. That's something we'll all be watching for extremely closely. Thank you. I now call Lee Murray, followed by Jim Hume. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Now, I haven't been involved in the passage of the Bill at all, and while I recognise the concerns that some members have raised, I want to use my very short period of time uh, to actually welcome the provisions on uh, Solway cockle beds, which the Minister didn't really have time uh, to describe in his uh, in his uh, speech uh, uh, at this part of stage three, the cockle, uh, Solway cockle beds have had a very uh, checkered history. They were overfished in the early 2000s. They were closed in 2002. The Solway Shellfish Management Association was formed in 2006 by a statutory instrument in this place, and it was given the unenviable task of both regulating the kosher, cockle fishery when it reopened and also, also some enforcement powers. Uh, they, in terms of granting of licences, they granted over 100 licences. However, 50% of them were local, 50% of them were not. It was a huge stromash around it, uh, and I had uh, loads of people at my surgeries complaining about licences and all the rest of it. And unfortunately, despite this, the cockle stocks declined further, and no more uh, licences were issued after 2007-2008, and the beds had to be closed again in 2001. And indeed, enforcement has always been an extremely difficult uh, problem. In past centuries, the, Sol the Solway was infamous for the activities of pirates and smugglers, and it was indeed those physical features which aided the pirates and the smugglers, which also aided the illegal, illegal cocklers, the coastline of bays and coves with few points of access to the sea from the public roads uh, and many across uh, private land. And indeed, um, both before and after the fishery reopened, I received reports from constituents living near the coast about po possible illegal activity, vehicles on the beach, uh, caravans on private lands which seem to contain what might have been migrant workers, uh, boats being launched, launched from private access points. These reports were passed on to the police and SSMA, but it was very difficult to follow those up. And the, the danger is not just that it's illegal, it's also potentially extremely dangerous. The incoming tide is famously known in the Solway as been faster than a galloping horse. That is, uh, you know, more than 25 to 30 miles an hour, faster than a person can run, faster than a vehicle can drive in soft sand. And therefore, people actually being exposed to illegal cockering are also at great danger of illegal, of losing their lives. And indeed, we know about the uh, events in Morecambe Bay uh, in, 2000, uh, in uh, 2004, where 23 people lost their lives in a gang incident. That could easily happen on the Solway. And therefore, the fact that we have now, at stage two, passed amendments which allow the courts to consider circumstantial evidence pointing to legal activity. Bring your remarks to close. Uh, one of the things which wasn't possible when I was receiving these reports in the past, which also give the police powers of access to private land, and indeed uh, that they actually can enforce the right to, to enter private land to, to investigate some of these reports, extremely important.
important, I think, in the detection and prevention of illegal activity. Some campaigners think the bill should have gone further, but I'm pleased that this has been done, uh, that it's been recognised action was required, and therefore pleased that this is included in the bill. Thank you, Ms Murray. Jim Hume, followed by Rob Gibson. Thanks, Presiding Officer. To say the progress of this bill has been without controversy through committee would be pushing it to say the least. Tip for tat even made it possibly for the first time into a committee report. I think it's also the first time that I had had anyone accuse a Conservative member uh, at the committee of uh, wishing to nationalise an industry, <laughs> if I remember correctly. Today we raise concerns uh, relate submissions from the government as there wasn't enough time for a committee to scrutinise. It's essential that all legislation is properly scrutinised. We have to remember that to legislate in haste often results in repenting at leisure. Now, we didn't vote against the government amendments, but abstained, abstained as we couldn't be confident that there wouldn't be any uh, unattended consequences of not scrutinising legislation properly. But I must say it has helped all our voting records uh, today with all those uh, abstinations. I was also concerned at the amendment re-individually numbered tagging of fish. I've been wary of such methods in some parts of agriculture and feel that over-regulation may go too far and prove to be difficult to, to implement. So I'm glad Alex Ferguson today did not uh, push those, but also glad that uh, the Minister promised to look into those. Uh, what the progress of this bill did raise was the importance of both wild fishing and fish farming, uh, that they both play in, in the role of the economy of, of Scotland. Wild fishing in, in my own region is important. Uh, I believe fees are in the region of up to £30,000 a week for five rods at the junction pool in Kelso. Therefore, in the government's wish to see fish farming increase its contribution to our economy through a growth agenda, it's right to ensure we protect what we do have. I also share the ambition for growth in our fish farm industry. Scottish smoked salmon receives, achieves a, a premium in the, in the marketplace, and deservedly so. My own amendments, uh, which I pushed at stage two, the principle of which was accepted by the, uh, the Minister uh, earlier. Uh, we worked on that, and I'm glad that the Chamber has today uh, accepted that there needs to be regulation retraining. It was obvious that we need to, uh, training to be part of a developing technical standard. It was recognised as a need by the Scottish Agriculture Research Forum uh, themselves, and the Containment Working Group also demonstrated that, of course, around 29.5% of escaped fish was uh, due to human error, uh, presiding officer. I haven't time to go into details of record keeping. In, uh, uh, no, you lights. don't. You need to I, bring your remarks to a close as quickly as possible. In, into detail, as I have uh, really the potential of, of triploids. But I'm, glad, I'm glad we have a, a bill that will have uh, training as a requirement uh, to, regarding equipment. And, of course, uh, I would like to congratulate uh, Paul Wilson uh, in anticipation of getting this bill through the Parliament at decision time today. Finally, Rob Gibson. Thank you, President Officer. As the convener of the RACI Committee, uh, we have had a long oversight of this bill. We welcome its progress. Uh, I was pleased that this bill gives the Scottish Government's Ministerial Group for Sustainable Aquaculture oversight of the Code of Good Practice for Ag Aquaculture. Will the Minister undertake to monitor the paragraphs in the Code which state that GM organisms should not be introduced to fish farms with a view to change that should to must as soon as possible. The urgency of this is underlined by the relaxation of their rules on the use of GM soya feed for animals and fish by a string of leading retailers except Waitrose. Will the Minister assure Parliament that the Scottish food authenticity will be a specific priority as the natural provenance of Scottish produce is not helped by the use of GM soya feed? Other European producers, and indeed Waitrose, have secured uh, GMO-free soya and emphasised this by introducing GMO-free labelling. This earns the premium for these products and is in response to widespread consumer concern that GM ingredients in our food is not welcome. In addition, I am pleased that the Scottish Government will now bring forward a consultation this summer on the further democratisation of district salmon fishery boards, as the wider uh, access to our rivers for salmon angling should be a facet of the sustainable management of all species in our total catchment area management approach. 
Angling is and can be an even bigger contributor to fragile rural economies such as those in my constituency, as well as tackling climate change mitigation. This, like many other matters, was discussed and will flow from this successful passage of the Bill which is before us today. We wish it well and what follows from it. Thank you, Mr Gibson. I now call on uh, Jimmy McGregor. Mr McGregor, you have no more than four minutes. Uh, I refer members to my fisheries entry in the Register of Members' Interests. Uh, there is widespread recognition of the economic importance of both aquaculture and wild fisheries to Scotland's economy. This is especially so in my region of the Highlands and Islands, where fish farm employment helps to underpin many local communities. Farm Scottish salmon has the much coveted La Belle Rouge, which demonstrates its excellence, while at the same time Scotland is a world-famous location for wild fishing in its lochs and rivers, as the Minister um, stressed. Now, as part of my European Committee's inquiry into the China Plan, I recently visited the Marine Harvest Processing Factory at Fort William, a significant employer in Loch Harbour. I had not visited a salmon processing factory for a few years, and the improvement in the quality of the fish over that time was plain to see. All marine harvest fish are processed in one factory, they are picked up by lorry, taken to Heathrow, and flown out, which means they can be in China in a very short time. The potential for growth in the Chinese market is great. The labelling on the boxes gives total traceability. You can not only see what cage, on which site the fish came from, but tell also which individual had packed the box of fish. So no lack of transparency in this side of aquaculture so it's disappointing, therefore, that despite lobbying from many sides, the Scottish Government has not agreed with the well-thought-out amendments of my friend Alex Ferguson that sea lice data should be published on a farm-by-farm -farm basis as it is in Norway, in Chile and in Ireland. So can the Minister explain why this lack of transparency does not exist in other fish farming countries? A big theme at the Stage 1 debate and the Royal Affairs Committee's scrutiny of the Bill and the report has been the need for two sectors, the wild and the farmed, to work together more constructively. This was an opportunity to improve working methods and public relations. People I've spoken to in the aquaculture industry were not alarmed by this request to be more transparent. So why is the Scottish Government so intransigent on sea lice? It will leave the wild fish industry disappointed. Indeed, the Salmon and Trout Association is calling it a missed opportunity to protect and conserve Scotland's wild fish heritage. Can the Minister say something to relieve their concerns? Because their disappointment stems from the Government's failure to accept amendments at Stage 2, and again today from Claudia Beamish, which would have increased the amount of information publicly available on sea lice. Will the Minister at least instruct Marine Scotland to analyse Scotland-wide sea lice data at a farm management area level on a quarterly basis in order to assess the performance of sea lice management and to test the SSPO reporting system. Because I think all of us recognise that we want and need to achieve a sustainable coexistence between wild fishery and fish farming industries. And this is what I've argued for all my time in this Parliament. And we know that this can be best achieved when both sectors trust each other. It remains to be seen whether this bill will help towards that aim. But ministers need to continue to strive to address the concerns of wild fishery interests, particularly in the West and Northwest, where genuine concerns still exist about the decline in wild fish numbers and the reasons behind that decline. The Scottish Conservatives will continue to speak up about these issues while also supporting the sustainable growth of our aquaculture producers. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Cleo Baker, Ms Baker, no more than four. Um, thank you, President Officer. Uh, this bill has been an attempt to address some of the issues surrounding wild fisheries in the aquaculture sector. And while this afternoon is an opportunity to reflect on what has been agreed, it is also, as members have highlighted, the time to turn to questions of implementation and what happens next. Following the initial consultation, there were a number of contentious issues that haven't been taken forward in the bill, carcass tagging and salmon netting rights, for example. But they must be addressed, and the future work streams highlighted by others around wild fisheries and sustainable aquaculture are essential. However, as the Minister said, 98% of fish farms are signed up to good practice, which raises the question of whether this bill is about consolidating what already happens rather than addressing some of the key issues that have been highlighted by Alex Ferguson. 
We have a growing aquaculture sector which makes a significant contribution to Scotland's economy, both nationally and locally. It is a business which provides employment in rural areas, employing more than 6,000 people, often long-term skilled employment. The amendments on training this afternoon are welcome, and we recognise that people are working in difficult conditions, and the standards of training and health and safety must be high. Achieving the target of increasing production of all farmed fish by 50% based on a 2011 baseline by 2020 is ambitious. If we are to see this rate of expansion, we need to be sure that the regulatory system in place is robust and it has the confidence of consumers and wider interests. And in recent weeks, we have seen reports that pesticides from 12 salmon farms have contaminated lochs around Scotland's coast in breach of safety limits. And since 2010, this has become an annual report from SEPA, one which consistently raises questions over the environmental impact. Labour has sought to take a proportionate approach to the bill, and at stage one, the committee debated at length the issue of the publication of sea life data. There was certainly a recognition that there could be greater transparency and information sharing, and Labour brought forward a consensus amendment. So it's disappointing that, once again, the evidence heard at stage one and supported in the stage one report is then rejected at the amendment stage on the recommendation of the Minister. And we saw the twisting and turning of committee members this afternoon on this issue. We do recognise that industry is to increase its reporting to 30 areas of data, but the international quality of Scottish salmon relies on its reputation for comparatively high standards of health and welfare for farmed fish, and greater transparency should not be anything to fear and would only strengthen its reputation. The industry and the Minister raise concerns regarding commercial risk, but it is argued that no other industry is protected in this way, and the strongest comments came from SEPA on this matter. And so it's disappointing that these concerns have not been addressed by the legislation and there has been such reluctance on the part of the government to take a stronger lead on this issue. While the Minister did give a commitment to reviewing the success or otherwise of SSPO proposals on sea life publication, it is not clear how this success will be judged and he might want to give an indication of this in his closing remarks. So in closing, it is crucial that the right level of regulation is in place for the sector. No one in the debate today wants to see regulation which would damage the industry, but there have been calls for proportionate regulation that protects consumer confidence, recognising that across our food chain there is perhaps now more than ever a need for transparency and robust governance. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I call on Paul Wheelhouse to wind up the debate. Five minutes, Minister. I'll try my best, presiding officer. Um, I would like to again thank all members for the contributions uh, to today's debate. One thing I didn't mention earlier on, but I would like to, uh, is I came to the post late in the pre-legislative stages of the bill, and I'd also like to thank Stuart Stevenson for all his early work in his ministerial capacity. Um, I, uh, the road we have travelled since then has certainly not been without its challenges. Uh, there have been occasions when the debate has been less constructive, as the Iraqi Committee noted in its Stage 1 report. Uh, the Bill provides us with the legislative tools to ensure that farmed and wild fisheries and their interactions with each other continue to be managed effectively, maximising the combined contribution to supporting sustainable economic growth, with, but with, crucially with due regard to the wider marine environment. The Bill also provides a foundation in which to move forward and better manage our relationships and to build trust. Uh, the refreshed Ministerial Group for Sustainable Aquaculture has engaged the minds of our stakeholders and there is a tide of optimism that proactive activity will take place over the coming months and years. Indeed, members of the MGSA have helped to inform many of the provisions we have debated over in the last few months. That group met for the first time a couple of weeks ago, as I said earlier, and everyone is keen to look forward and not back. They recognise the need to address any negative perceptions that may have emerged, and there is also a genuine acceptance that the debate has often excluded the many positive activities that take place. And it is important that we don't lose sight of the many good examples of local engagement that already exist. Um, improved governance arrangements for our fisheries boards and enhanced salmon management through the Bill, coupled with the planned fisheries management review, will also bring with it many opportunities. So we encourage all of our stakeholders to reflect on how they might better promote these and other positive examples of their work. And as I speak here today, I am confident in saying that the Bill is proportionate and strikes the right balance. Um, I'd like to turn to a couple of points, uh, time permits, uh, forbids me for doing too much of this, I'd like to turn to a couple of points that have been raised. On carcass tagging, uh, important points raised by both Angus MacDonald and Alex Ferguson uh, and sought clarity about the, the timescales involved. Um, consultation will be for the standard 12-week period. Uh, we'll look to run this in parallel with the notification to the EU. 
and uh, EU approval timetable is for the EU to determine, of course, but it can be up to 18 months, but only if they have issues with what is being proposed. So I would hope it would be potentially faster than that. Uh, Rob Gibson has raised the point regarding uh, GM uh, and the, the potential for GM uh, feed to get into the food chain. And I think it's a very important point that he raises. Uh, the government does intend to, to look to bring forward a debate uh, as soon as possible after the summer recess to assess food authenticity and food labelling in recognition of the issue that the, the member has raised. And I, I welcome his support for the management review that we are proposing as phase two of this important development of the wild fisheries and aquaculture sector. Jamie McGregor raised the point about um, you know, what evidence have we uh, to, to demonstrate uh, why uh, transparency is, is a risk. Uh, I, I think the point made by Graham Day earlier on, which I, I recognise is open to challenge from others because there is more than one factor involved, did indicate that publication of sea lice uh, data did damage the Irish uh, aquaculture sector, uh, but I will certainly look more closely at that myself. Um, the Bill does, um, in terms of the, uh, the measures we have, we have discussed today, uh, I recognise that some have reservations about the approach we have taken to voluntary reporting of data. They were evident in the earlier debate. However, I sincerely believe that encouraging the voluntary sharing of information, and not just in the context of sea lice, accompanied with appropriate explanatory text, is the right way forward. I repeat what I have said previously. We will not seek to legislate where we do not need to. I believe this is one example. It is clearly for others to demonstrate that the government's support for voluntary measures has been well placed. And I think we all know who I mean. And equally clear is our existing ability to progress through le uh, secondary legislation if the voluntary approach is not working as expected. I think the point was raised by Claudia Beamish as to how we would, or perhaps, sorry, our colleague uh, Claire Baker as to how we would mar uh, test whether that had been met. I think the publication data will show us if there is a persistent pattern of sea lice infestations within fish farms across Scotland, we will know it is not working and, and driving down the numbers. Uh, but I, I, I certainly agree I will keep her consulted on what we are doing in, in regard to that. I was pleased to be able to support amendments lodged by Jim Hume around training in relation to equipment used in fish farming, and I thank him for his willingness um, to uh, engage on the drafting and for the opportunity to explore what might best deliver a result which we could all agree with. Um, in closing, I have constant time presiding officer. In closing, I want to end the debate, uh, today's debate on a really positive note. Everyone here today recognises the enormous benefits to Scotland and the people of Scotland of successful and thriving aquaculture and wild fishery sectors that can develop. Uh, and, and I recognise that some um, sorry, uh, improved governance arrangements for our fisheries boards and enhanced salmon uh, management through the bill, coupled with the planned fisheries management group, will also bring with it many opportunities. So I encourage all uh, stakeholders to reflect on how they might better promote those. Uh, and, presiding officer, uh, time is, is short, so now is the time to look forward to be positive and to begin to build the relationships that allow us to prosper in the future. We have a clear implementation plan going forward. There is much to do, and the bill provides the foundation. So I move the Parliament agrees that the Agriculture and Fisheries Scotland Bill be passed. Thank you. Can I thank everybody for their cooperation in a very short time, uh, space of time. The, that concludes the debate on motion number S4M 06544. The next item of business consideration of business motion S4M 06571. In the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a business programme. Any member who wishes to speak against it should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion S4M 06571. Formally moved. No member is asked to speak against the motion. Therefore, I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number S4M 06571, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business, consideration of business motion S4M 06573, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick, on behalf of the Parliamentary Bureau, setting out a timetable at stage one for the Children and Young People Scotland Bill. Any member who wishes to speak against the motion should press the request to speak button now. And I call on Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number S4M 06573. Moved. No members asked to speak against the motion. I now put the question to the Chamber. The question is that motion number S4M 06573 in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. The motion is therefore agreed to. The next item of business is consideration of parliamentary bureau motion on designation of a lead committee at stage one of the Tribunal Scotland Bill. I'd ask Joe Fitzpatrick to move motion number S4M 06572. Moved. The question on this motion will be put at decision time. There are two questions to be put as a result of today's business. The first question is that motion number S4M 06544 in the name of Paul Wheelhouse on the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. 
The Parliament has agreed and the Aquaculture and Fisheries Scotland Bill is now passed. The next question is at motion number 6572, in the name of Joe Fitzpatrick and the designation of a lead committee at stage one of the Tribunal Scotland Bill be agreed to. Are we all agreed? The motion is therefore agreed to. That concludes decision time. We will now move to members' business. Members who leave the chamber should do so quickly and quietly.